Hello, everyone, and welcome to an insane episode of Hotline League, because not only will we be talking about Worlds, probably more in the second half of the show, which is, I know, a little weird because Worlds just happened, but we're going to be talking about this new league, which is not the LCS, which just got announced. I mean, I guess it's formally announced. We've known for a while about it, and we're going to be talking to two folks who are participating in the league and ways in which... Neither team was participating in the league previously. Maybe that's the way we'll phrase it. Either way, with me, as always, is my co-host, Cubby. Cubby, how was Worlds for you? Uh, it was great. We had a watch party in the morning, uh, had some friends over, and I got to wake up and feel like I was 11 years younger than I am now watching Faker hard carry games. It was crazy. So uh, it was a great conclusion and an awesome tournament. Yeah. No, I, I really enjoyed it. I just got back from... The UK actually last night, but I think that I've avoided the jet lag because I fell asleep at around 1 a.m. and woke up this morning at 8.30 a.m. So I feel like I feel good for the show. I was really worried about doing the Hotline League right after I got back from a an international travel the next day. I, I was worried I'd be jet lagged, but we're we're good. Uh, shout out before I, I get to my esteemed guest for the evening to our sponsors for this episode. NZXT, Prize Picks, and Pagoda. We'll be talking about... Uh, all those wonderful brands later on in the evening, but first off, we have uh, we have Mister Joseph Jang, Jungle Juice from Hundred Thieves. How's it going, Joseph? Good, doing great. Yeah, it's good to have you on. I should say we'll talk about why you're on in a little bit, but I just want to you know, as people are getting ready to fill up the caller queue, let everybody know that Joseph reached out to me this morning and was like, "Hey, I love." a chance to come talk to people and the community directly. I know there's a lot of things that have been said back and forth. And so I thought it was really cool that he was like, oh, I think this is, you know, a, a way in which I'd love to have that conversation. Cause I think a lot of other folks, you know, whenever the things are, are spicy, you know, folks don't always want to come out and address them. So we'll have uh, some really great conversations with you and just a little bit, Joseph. And then joining the league, joining a new league, he said he's joining the LCS. I don't know if he realizes it doesn't exist anymore. Is Disguised Toast. Toast, how's it going? Good. Good. Been uh, a busy last couple of weeks. Um, I'm probably going to get busier over the next couple of months. But excited to be here. Second time on. Um, first time was when we joined the NACL. And now, I guess, again, when we're joining the LTA. Yeah. And we've had some discussions over the years about you wanting to get into the league. So it's really cool and exciting to see that you've been able to do that. So uh, congratulations on on getting in. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're not going to waste too much time uh, going back and forth on, on world stuff. We'll talk about that in the second half because I think we're going to probably lose Toast and Joseph in uh, after about an hour, a little bit longer than that. So we'll do kind of like the jibber jabber about worlds and all that type of thing. In the second half, feel free to skip ahead there if you want that first, and then you can always come back later if you're listening to the podcast or on YouTube. But uh, let's see. Let's let's go ahead and and Cubby, why don't you explain how the show works so that while I ask our esteemed guests about what they've been doing lately with the league, uh, we, we can get people queued up in the waiting room. Yeah, uh, if you guys want to call into the show, go to discord.gg slash Travis or command discord explanation mark discord. Uh, you can find the Discord link. Uh, call in. You at me, at Cubby, so I can see it. And then you have to be sitting in one of the calls if you do want to join. Uh, if we like your take, we'll drag you into the waiting room. And then we'll grab callers so you can talk with me, Travis, and, of course, Toast and Joseph as well. Yeah. So that's how the show works. Also, if you are a sub on Twitch or a member of our YouTube, please make sure you link with your Discord so that you can get access to the subtopics channels uh, that moves a little slower and we do check both of those so if you want to get on the show that's also a, a nice way to uh, support the channel while also increasing your chances of getting cubby to see you standing out in the in the list of takes all right so let's first start with uh joseph so joseph for those who were laser focused on the lcs or sorry on worlds this year um, and missed the announcements around the LCS, the new LTA, et cetera. Do you want to talk a little bit about what 100 Thieves announced last week? Yeah, so last week we had a coordinated announcement with Riot when you know they li went live with all the updates regarding the LTA, which is what it's called now. 
And we had an announcement that we sold our franchise slot in the LCS and that we'd be joining uh, the LTA now as a provisional guest partner. And again, it, when I'm reflecting on that, I don't think we did the best job of communicating you know, everything that we needed to. So obviously there's a lot of mixed sentiment and I would say a lot of concern from the fans. So I just wanted to thank you for providing me a platform to kind of address those concerns. Um, but it's it's obviously a big change for us. Uh, we've been in the LCS for a very, very long time. Um, I think we've always like tried to do our best, put our best foot forward with, you know, amateur or putting together really interesting rosters, whether that was like with Soren and Doublelift or, you know, with a lot of the, you know, upcoming rookies with the roster that we fielded this year. So, um, you know, I think for us, like we've always been big fans of League of Legends, big fan of this league. So we're just very glad Ride was able to work out something with us while we kind of figure out what happens uh, after this year. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, I'm sure folks will want to follow up on that conversation a little bit. I, You know, one thing I think people have been confused about is like, what is a provisional slot? You know, like I think a lot of people are kind of like, what does that what does that mean? Uh, obviously, you've explained a little bit of that, but if there's any way you can kind of help differentiate that versus like another guest slot or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, when Riot was informing the team owners that we were transitioning from the LCS to the LTA and all the changes with that, obviously, um, they presented organizations with the opportunity to have their slot bought back from Riot, right? And you saw Energy and Immortals leave the league earlier this year. And you know, I think just given the financial circumstances in esports right now, uh, we kind of had to have that conversation with Riot. And we were like, hey, is there a world where we can continue like being in League of Legends because it's been a big part of our history? Um, and this is kind of the conclusion we came to. So what, if it, what is a provisional guest slot? So we have a one-year term with the LTA, and we be treated like just like any other partner. Obviously, the stipend is a little bit different, but you know, we still have the ability to qualify for all the international tournaments. We'd be in the regular season games just like usual. I stated that operationally, nothing would change for us. Um, the only difference is that our TPA agreement is for a year. Um, so, you know, we're currently working with Riot to see what happens after the end of 2025, and those are pretty much the major changes, right? So, I think. For 2025 fans shouldn't have that many questions. Things stay the same. You know, we're not really the guest team, which is kind of what, you know, Toast is doing with joining the LCS, where they have like the promotion relegation spot. For us, we're considered one of the provisional partners. I, th I hope that clarifies most yeah. of the. Yeah, and if not, I'm sure that. folks can call in and talk a little bit more about it. Okay, Toast. So I know we kind of spoiled the lead at the beginning of the show. But on the other hand, you want to talk a little bit about what uh, Disguised announced this past week? Yeah, so our org DSG slash Disguised, we've been chosen to have that initial guest slot for 2025 in the new LTA. Essentially, it's a spot that people have to play for every single year. And Riot decided that to start off the first year, we should just have someone there. And they did it by kind of like application because um, I think they decided it in the middle of the NACL season, but didn't feel like it was the best idea to just make the winner of this year's NACL the winner of like the, the person who gets the spot because it was just short notice. So they invited us to apply with like a bunch of other orgs. And we were lucky enough to be chosen for that spot. Um, big part of the reason why I think is because of our success in 2023, as well as the extra attention we bring to the league. So super grateful to be given this opportunity. This was kind of like the goal um, of DSG when we entered league and to be here is uh, a dream come true. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, Toast, like, this has been a process for you. I, I just kind of want to give you the floor to open up. I, obviously, I've uh, DSG's been in NACL. I've gotten the chance to meet a lot of the team that you've put around you, which is something that I give you a lot of credit for as a creator getting into this. It really feels like you surrounded yourself with smart people. Like, 
who are the people outside of you that you feel like deserve credit? And what was the process of kind of building this out initially as you really built out the team that's behind the scenes that supports your this esports operation? Got it. A big part of it comes from my co-founder partner, uh, Robin uh, Fiflerin. I'm not sure if people here know him, but back in the day, he was a pretty well-known CS GoPro. And um, he used to be VP of esports at Dignitas. So he's been like just a huge help navigating the entire like contracts and player database and legality and even down to like health insurance. Um, all the, the nitty gritty of actually running an LCS team, uh, now an LTA team. And he knows the people in the space. So he's been doing a great job um, just making sure we're talking to the right people. We have this new manager, Chris, who used to be our Valorant coach. And he's kind of like learning how to be like a manager for League of Legends, but he's doing a lot of the groundwork. Um, and that's kind of like where we're starting from for our League of Legends endeavors. And of course, everyone we've met in the scene has been super helpful. Everyone's always offering help. It could be yourself, like over the last couple of years, I'm pretty sure we've come to and asked, hey, who do you like, who do you think we should sign? Like, who do, who do you have your eye on? Um, but it's, it's been, it's been a lot of, um, help from everyone else. I, I'm just kind of the face of it. If I'm being quite honest. Well, I'm excited to get into the nitty gritty, gritty details of all of it with you tonight. The face of it. All right. Uh, either, either way, either way uh, I think it is a good time to just start pulling callers because I know that we uh, we have limited time and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask their questions. So, folks, generally speaking, we will be talking about worlds and all that in the second half of the show. Right now, we have our guests at the moment. We're going to be joined by Spooks, actually, I believe, in the second half of the show. Uh, and so he'll be coming in from 100 Thieves to talk a little bit more about not just the 100 Thieves stuff, but also his opinions on worlds and all that stuff as well. So that'll be really fun. And uh, and yeah, that's that's when we'll do it. I think if folks want to ask questions about uh, Disguised or 100 Thieves or just generally have takes about the LTA, uh, this would be a great time to do so. So I know, Cubby, we've already pulled some folks in the waiting room. You want to just go ahead and grab one? Yeah, uh, here we go. Uh, while we do that, thank you so much to Misha, who gifted 20 memberships over on YouTube. Very awesome. Jeremy for the five over on YouTube. YouTube kind of crushing it tonight. Normally, Twitch takes the, the crown, but uh, we got Yoser with the two years. Thank you for the memberships or for the subs over on Twitch. And Glimmer Glenn, thank you for the 35 months. Super appreciate it. We got our first caller of the evening. It's Franklin. Franklin, where are you calling from? Uh, State College, Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania. What do you want to talk about on the show tonight? All right, I'll just go on my take. Yeah. Um. Uh, my take is that brand buildings for teams going to be really, really hard in 2025, even more than I think it was this year. I think the LTA system is very much more like an open circuit league than like a franchise league due to the format. If you're very bad on stage, you're going to be even like, it's going to be even like a struggle to brand even more than it was this year because you're going to be playing less games. I think like established teams like C9, FlyQuest, and TL are all probably kind of fine with these changes because there's no real way they could bomb out. But if a team like DSG or Leon or Dig completely bombs out in winter or summer, then the only thing we're going to get to see them from like the entire year is going to be the 14 best of ones in spring and I think some of the BO3s in winter and in summer. Uh, like the majority of all the team's stage games are going to be in the spring split. And some teams are going to bomb out in winter playoffs. And then after four weeks of summer, like two teams get eliminated, where I think one team I'm pretty sure two teams get eliminated in the first four weeks of summer. So if you're a bottom tier team, like you, you don't really have that much time to actually like show off in the actual league compared to 2024, where you had all 14 games of best of one in spring and at least seven best of threes in summer. But like, as but instead now instead of like back to back splits, like you could play best of series. Like you play you play a BO3 in winter and then play a BO3 all the way in summer, basically, and the whole time is just best of one. So. It might. It's it's actually less games minimum. I think. I think total this year is thirty games total. Like regardless of anything, but your minimum games next year could be, is about twenty six stage games. But it's even over. Like I think it's gonna be like a little bit of a longer time. So that's kind of my issue. So yeah, for I those think, that are unfamiliar with what is being referenced, in addition to the LTA stuff, they announced the new format for the all the leagues, I guess, including the uh, LTA. I keep wanting to say the LCS. It's gonna take 
a yeah. long time to get used to that, including the LTA. And the LTA will be a three split system. And within those splits, uh, especially in winter and summer, uh, there it's like pretty aggressive in terms of how quickly teams can drop out. So uh, we've seen that kind of previously with the LEC, but that's also where they're going here. So you're saying it's just going to make it really difficult, I guess, for teams to sort of build their notoriety and that type of stuff, right, Color? I I just think it's going to be super duper hard, especially because like teams like the truth is that teams are going to lose out. I think Shopify went in like oh six or oh four like this year before they actually started picking up series. I don't think they want a single stage with Tomio actually in the roster, so they went oh four. So in LTA they'd be completely done before they even got the chance to sub the void back in. So I just think it's kind of like rough. I I think it's like kind of good from a competitive standpoint in a way the same people had a lot of issues with the lec like format the same reasons that like teams can drop out really really early but like so like you get to see more good league and like quotation marks but like if you're a bad team or you're a fan of a bad team then your team just goes away basically like halfway through the format so it's like kind of like a bummer in that sense but there are some advantages i think too uh, for like all the, the games being concentrated in spring i guess the biggest one is that like if we're back to best of ones, it means all the players are going to be in the studio at the same days. So Marks on the dive said that like you have better content days because you know like you know who's going to be in the studio, so you can like pull people for for pros and things like that. So, all right. Well, uh, let's just go ahead and dive in. Yeah, what do we think of the new format, especially with regards to like teams building brand and notoriety and all that stuff? This might be the first time that. Toast is hearing about the new format, so I'm going to let him process that if uh, he hasn't heard about it yet. So, Joseph, what do you think of the new format and what it means for like a team? Because uh, it is much more co- cutthroat than it has been in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think it being cutthroat is definitely true. But I think the biggest misconception that a lot of fans have around brand building or just socials and content is that it's heavily reliant on team performance like it definitely plays a factor but from my experience i think you're able to build um interesting storylines or you know putting your brand forward regardless of the competitive results obviously it's harder but i've seen so many orgs do it um like even team liquid when they were struggling in like early spring this year um they were putting out some of the best like league of legends content like around the world um so I think you can definitely defy that norm. It's just about a matter of how you handle it. And I think specifically for Disguise, like I kind of see them as like a very early um, replica almost of like 100 Thieves in a sense that like Toast feels very much to me like a Matt where he's kind of like the face of the brand. And I think so many teams are bought into DSG and what they've done in the tier two ecosystem that like even if they struggle in a couple of their early series i think they have enough fandom and enough of a voice in the community to make content regardless of you know their results so yes it is harder but i think that's more of a fault of teams historically not being able to identify what draws in like fans regardless of results and you know they can only do so much from riot's standpoint on the broadcast and the bracket to really facilitate that Gotcha. All right. Uh, Toast, what do you think of all this stuff? Uh, I'm not too familiar with, with like the upside and downside of the format because I hear people talk about BO3s, BO1s, what they prefer, what's better for narrative, what's better for competitive. Um, from what it looks like, the format they're using is actually a little similar to Valorant where they also struggle with getting enough games for the players as well as they also did the whole three split thing where the first like international tournament is kind of like a kickoff almost like split one is it's like half a regular split and it looks like that's yes. what we're gonna get for the lta that is definitely accurate. um for us i think i feel pretty confident in building like a storyline and a good brand but ultimately the best thing i like about esports is at the end of the day you just have to be good right You have to win. Winning is super important. I believe Team Liquid had a chat with Steve about like the TL philosophy, and he said, "No, you gotta win. Like, win at any cost." Kind of deal. I think that's just true for esports. Like, when you're winning, every decision you made in the year is suddenly the best decision. 
but when you are losing, suddenly everything is the worst decision. Like these fans kind of don't. Ha- there's no like nuance. There's no understanding of what has risk and what has rewards. It's just you win, you're right. You're wrong. If you lose, you're wrong. Um, and unfortunately for DSG, we can't really afford to play around too much because we have to play for our relegation spot. So we can't get experimental. We can't, for example, put in Delta Fox with Scar and Alma Cutie Pie, even though the fans would love that because we have to play for our spot every single year. We have to both simultaneously think about, okay, well, how do we survive this year, right? Because we're still up against really good teams. We're going to be up against the best tier two team. How do we survive the year? And if we're focused on surviving, can we even think about like 2026, 2027? Uh, and uh, formats like this is, yeah, definitely rough, like the viewer said, because we're probably going to suck in our first year, right? We're coming in, and only the top two teams get to go to international, and there's eight teams in the league. Um, chances are we're not going to be one of the teams going to international in our first year. Uh, so we're probably going to miss out on a lot of extra attention. But, yeah, we're just going to have to do the best we got. Like, I think whatever format Riot comes up with, it's always going to make the lower performing team suffer a little bit, but I mean, that's just esports. That's competition, right? You're not going to get the airtime you want unless you're good. Yeah. No, I think um, that's. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll keep it short, but if I was Riot, I think I don't care about winter split. I think winter split is whatever. And if they want to make it quick and snappy, that's fine. I'm not excited for that international tournament. And Fearless Draft is kind of a novelty in itself. So that's whatever. Uh, I would have flipped the formats for spring and summer. I would have put the pick'em split in spring and then had summer be a single best of three round robin instead of a double best of one round robin. Uh, you had both TL and FlyQuest saying that best of threes were important for them in terms of getting ready for Worlds. And I think this was these... Like, we sent as NA the strongest teams that we've sent to Worlds in a long time. Uh, so the pick em splits like kind of weird. I find it really weird that like you're either being picked or you're picking opponents as you go to worlds and then it's a single best of 5 to get to worlds again even if you are the one seed from each uh division of Americas. So yeah, I I feel like in a way the format is a couple steps backward but I do appreciate how it's a bunch of like it's different every split. I like that. And I just think Well, that the take cubby was was more from. I think around the brand building that's associated with the format, right? So like that's fine. I think, but, I think like, format I conversations will be me. Like a separate yeah. conversation, but I do think like it is it is very true that somebody like Toast, for instance, has his work cut out for him when like the, if the team is not doing well, uh, they will have a lot less screen time because like the format is so brutal. Uh, mm-hmm. But I guess I mean like the funny answer from Toast it sounds like is like, well, if we're not doing well, we're not in the league the next year, so it's. Uh, I guess it is it is a situation where like a lot of people forget that this is what promotion and relegation is about is it is difficult for teams to be able to take risks because they just have to win so that they can survive and keep the spot um which I think is is an interesting conversation to have uh I mean toast is, it's inter- I I think the thing that is funny to hear your answer with regards to this is you know you had this conversation with Steve where it's like oh yeah it's all about winning but I feel like a lot of the appeal of a disguised is that you have the opportunity to be representative of more than just a team that just goes and wins because one of the problems historically that the LCS had was that it was filled with eight to ten teams whose only brand uh, identity was we're gonna try to win everybody we're gonna try really hard and if we win then like you you can care about us and you should care about us because we're the team that's gonna win Whereas, like, I feel like Disguise has done a good job of of having a bit of an identity built around you, embracing more of, like, the Mimi stuff, kind of bringing back that old-school esports vibe. So that's what kind of surprised me about your answer. Uh, I guess the way I see it is the brand-building side is almost entirely separate from, like, the competitive winning side. Um, as It is way easier to build a brand when you're winning. That's for that's sure. That's certainly true, yes. <laughs> yeah. But um, I feel oh, like I feel like I can do a, a, the best I can on the brand side and the marketing side, but I, there's nothing I can do on the competitive side. So that's kind of where 
I need the team to be really focused on. But, you know, I don't know anything about how to win in League of Legends on a high level, right? So I can't really speak to that too much. Um, it's like, there's the brand side and then there's competitive side. I'm good on the first part. I don't know if I'm good on the second part. Yeah. And then you look at some old orgs that some of them are now leaving. They had neither. So if we have one out of two, we're already better than some orgs in the league. <laughs> but if we... Well said. Yeah, ideally we have both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to comment really quickly because I know you had a chat with Steve. Um, first of all, I completely agree. Like winning does have an impact on it. I just wish that wasn't like the complete takeaway because, I mean, for TL specifically, their entire brand is built around winning, right? Like they have a legacy team in League of Legends that always performs and like that's why their business model works. Um, so that kind of like mantra just kind of won't be translated to all the team owners. Um, and for, for like information toast, like historically winning is very, very correlated to how much um, each team owner spends in the league. There's always going to be anomalies of like money ball teams or super teams like flunking out, but generally the teams do based on how they spend relative to their opponents. Right, so if your core mantra is like winning, you're going to be in a business model where you're going to have to outspend everyone to try and win all the time, and obviously that's not going to be sustainable. So that's why when uh, a lot of these discussions come up around like how do you brand build, is it completely reliant on winning? I just, even though it helps, if your focus is only going to be on winning, you're going to run into the same like, I guess like walls that a lot of other organizations have faced before. So that that would be my only like word of advice. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely have to keep my, our eyes on the spending. I think we're going to be the lowest, well, maybe not the second lowest spending org in LTA this year. So trying to figure out how we make it work. Brand build while also not being relegated will be a really fun challenge. But yeah, you're right. Like, can't we can't really try and like, go after what Team Liquid did because... It's just super unsustainable. Yeah. It's like a another note about like I guess like Leon and Dig, not really DSG because DSG has to like defend their spot every single year. But like teams like Leon and Dig too, like what does like summer split look like? I guess if Dig doesn't really have a chance to like kind of like kind of like revitalize and gear up for playoffs, like they kind of did. Like I'm, they weren't exactly the best team going into playoffs, but they, were, they looked a lot better than they had I guess in the previous weeks. I think. So I, I just think that like the summer split. The summer split in general with like teams getting eliminated, not necessarily so early, but basically like halfway through, I think just like kind of takes the air out of like what could have been a more exciting playoffs, things like that. And I, I get that like the whole point is supposed to be like, summer split is supposed to be like a, feel like a tournament, but like it just feels like it kind of like gives you just less games just because I, they need to cut down on teams for the LTA playoffs. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just part of the new format, right? You're not getting six of eight you're getting four of eight so yeah it just kind of is what it has to be for both divisions i don't know yeah uh well i'm sure we'll have more of this conversation as time goes on and i feel like this is even i rarely say this but i feel like uh there's a decent chance that it might make sense for you to call back in with this take to get a different perspective uh when we get mark on because i'm pretty sure we'll get mark on in the next couple of weeks um so you know right now we have the team side conversations but i think it'll be fun also to get the uh the league side conversations then. So uh, that's what I'm working on. So th thank you so much uh, for calling in Franklin. Anything that you want to shout out here at the end? I want to shout out the whole LCS discord. All of those guys, Ride Rody is my boy. Uh, shout out new me in the chat too. Awesome. Thanks so much for the call. And we'll catch you next time. Thank you. All right. We've got more great calls coming up mm -hmm. in just a moment, but first off, it's time to take a quick break. So toast or uh, Joseph, if you need to go grab water or anything like that for the show, now's a good time to do that. Uh, because, oh, hang on. We've got Cubby in the waiting room. We're going to drag him back. Oh, hey, God. Cubby, it's oh. time for a sponsored moment. And you went off to the waiting room, so I was just yeah, dragging you back. Cubby, well, do you... Nice to have mod powers, isn't it? Do you want to talk about the delicious thing that's in front of you while I make a mad dash to the kitchen to also... Grab my delicious meal that I'll be eating on the stream. I do. Uh, this is why you should send me the ad read beforehand, Travis. But I will talk about <laughs> my pagoda snack roll break. 
uh, which is in front of me. I go with the microwave uh, iteration while Travis is grabbing his from the air fryer. And I got to say, guys, these are very tasty. Um, I have the chicken roll, but you can also find uh, pork. There are vegetarian options as well. And I actually, it's something I actually look forward to on the show now as a snack break. Uh, but yeah, uh, Pagoda Nice Enough, of course, was a sponsor of the LCS uh, late spring in the summer and coming in to support uh, TGI here in Hotline League as well to power this. Uh, and presumably now... a sponsor of the LTA next year. Hopefully. So all of us will be enjoying the presence of Pagoda Egg Rolls. Uh, I just grabbed mine from the uh, air fryer, air fryer, where it was getting mm -hmm. heated up. Uh, thanks to shout out to Kobe for having an air fryer in our home. And uh, boy, am I excited to tell you all about Pagoda Egg Rolls. They are, well, I should say Hotline League is brought to you by Pagoda Snacks. From crispy egg rolls to crunchy cream cheese wontons and savory crab rangoons, Pagoda Snacks, ready to crush your cravings, shop for them in the freezer section at your local grocery store, store or get them delivered by Instacart. Cubby, fill for me while I take my first bite. Well, I know you're also chewing, so I'll fill for you as you finish that bite. We need to get more coordinated with when one of us is eating and the other one is talking. But yeah. It's tough. I've got the delay, you know. I, what are you I eating? From the stream. Uh, I went with the chicken roll, as always. But I did cover that there are pork and vegetarian options, as there are many rolls you can buy within the store. Uh, I found mine at Ralph's. Uh, if you were at West Coast, that would make sense. But uh, yeah, you can look it up to see if you can find it in your local grocery store in the frozen you section. Can also use Instacart. There's a link in the mm -hmm. chat for that. And yeah, I mean, thanks to, to Pagoda for sponsoring the Pagoda Snack Break. I, I'm eating a Pagoda chicken egg roll. It has a crunchy wrapper made with white meat chicken, and it's air fry ready as I just prepared. So thank you so much to Pagoda for sponsoring Hotline League during our world's coverage. Uh, really appreciate them coming along with us on this journey. And I've seen a lot of people tweeting and sharing with us the fact that they've been getting Pagoda egg rolls. So thank you to Pagoda for sponsoring the show. Uh, disguised toast in the chat says 10 out of 10 that's how he would rate the ad read so i'm glad he's a professional so i appreciate that cubby you want to grab the next caller yeah i got it now yeah all right off he goes as he's finishing up his egg roll toast are you going to macau i will be attending macau yeah for tft for those that don't know i'm i'm jealous i have i was thinking about going as crazy as it is but i have two other events that weekend that i can't i, I can't uh, escape, but yeah, a good luck at it. Do you think you're going to do well? Uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to study really hard. We got a, a meme squad representing DSG at, at the event, so my hopes aren't high, but uh, hey. Will that roster strategy also be employed for next year's LTA lineup? Yeah, I thought about it. Even my first year in NAC, I really thought about like just subbing in five like old school league streamers scara shifter cutie etc yeah yeah even now I, some of them are hitting me up it's like yo just sub me in for one game for when we play the lta and <laughs> i said like okay maybe we're for like oh nine in the standings and the last game literally does not matter yeah well it's good to know we have that uh people can root for your failures if they want to see their former fr uh, former <laughs> players play all right we got yami here yami where are you calling from um, I'm calling for it from the DMV. Um, it's the District Maryland, D DC, Maryland, Virginia area, not the our place. Um, what do you want to talk about? Um, okay, yeah, I'm calling in with a question actually for both of the team representatives here today. And basically, I was curious what the incentive for fans to support like a provisional team is, since there's no guarantee that we will have the teams with us in the league next year. And I know, like, this is kind of ignoring, like, I know that 100 Thieves already kind of has a fan base, and, like, DSG Toast is bringing in his most popular free ring fan base, and that's, like, why Riot has brought him in the first place. But I'm curious, like, if there's new fans who are coming in, um, and you see, like, or new fans or existing fans who aren't, like, as familiar, and you see, like, oh, a team is maybe only going to be here for a year, why they would choose to support that team over a team that they have like a stronger guarantee will continue to reward their fandom for years to come. Yeah. How can people commit to you guys if you won't commit to them? <laughs> Commitment issues. Uh, uh, I can go first. Uh, well, 
uh, we would be down to commit long term. We just really don't have that option. We can only commit one year at a time because of the way the guest slot works. Uh, Good news I guess for you, Toast. You I've would... heard that at the end of 2025, there might be a team slot that's available for you to take. We don't know yet, but at least you could you could take a look into that. That might be an option. Yeah, I think if I borrow enough money, I can just maybe buy that slot from 100 Thieves. Or I guess Riot holds it now. If our team does well enough. Um, but yeah, I, I guess you would only follow DSG if you're interested in the story, right? The risks are way higher and the punishment for failure isn't just, eh, we go again next year. It's literally just elimination gone kaput um which i think is a compelling like narrative because for some of these teams the punishment for, like there's no punishment for failing just see you next year right and i don't think that's as good of a story um especially for some of the weaker teams but yeah i mean there's, there's always a chance we're not around next year so it's it's a very much an underdog story and yeah, that's that's kind of why we have. If you want a team that will stick around for the next three years, four years, that have one, well, Cloud Nine's their team. I quit there. Joseph, I know this is a contentious topic right now for hundred these fans. So yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, I I think that's a very good question, and you know, I think that's. A ri big reason why Riot wanted this franchise model in the first place, right? Like they wanted protection for a lot of the partners that were investing into the league. But yeah, from a broadcast perspective, from them working with the organizations, it's incredibly hard to build, you know, brands for the organizations if it's you know their spot in the league is murky year over year. So um, I think to answer your question, yeah, it's it's just straight up difficult. I'm not going to deny that and. What can we really do, like us or DSG? It's just we just have to have a more compelling storyline than every other team, um, and that's like the effort we need to put in to win your fandom. Whether that's a roster that's more interesting, more appealing, or wins more games than expected, or we have really great content supporting it, um, that's kind of the onus is on us to figure it out. But I think this is like the cards that these provisional teams are dealt with and we're going to try to do our best to win everyone's fandom. Yeah. I mean, I will, I will even jump in on, on both of these teams and sort of suggest like, I, I do really like what Toast is saying around like, Hey, the stakes are incredibly high for us compared to the other teams. Like if you want uh, a team that's like kind of risking at all, a team that could get relegated, I think that that's something where, you know, if, if there are a team that's going to really be trying to make sure that they can maintain that slot and the players are going to know that as well, right? Where uh, oftentimes when a team goes out of the league, many of those players struggle to find a spot in the next year, which is also one of the things that I would say about 100 Thieves, right? The stakes are going to be high for them too, because I, I, I mean, I don't mean to speak for Joseph or for Riot, but I would expect that if 100 Thieves places first next year, it is going to be uh, less likely that from a percentage chance that they are not in the league in 2026 than if they uh, if they place last. So I do think that like the stakes are incredibly high for these types of teams. And a lot of people have wanted and rooted for relegation and promotion for this exact type of storyline because they missed it whenever like pre-franchising. And the fact that, you know, both of these teams are in that position, I think, is there. And and by the way, like, I know there are probably some fans that are frustrated with the organization and uh, the decisions that were made on the 100 Thieves side. And Joseph has spoken to that, and I'm sure will continue to. But I also want to remind people that, like, Sniper, Golden Glue, like, these guys were not sitting there being like, yeah, you know what we should do, Riot? We should, uh, we should... You, you guys come by or slot. like these guys still care as much about the game as they did the previous year. And again, they know that the stakes are going to be high for them too, because in a perfect world, they're, they're going to do well and that will help encourage hundred thieves and riot to continue their partnership. But even in a different type of year, like they're also going to need to be proving that they can be amazing players and amazing coaches and staff for the other teams that are going to be looking for folks to pick up in the following year. So like all around, I would just say the stakes are high for both the players and the organizations. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that is 
in my personal opinion, a lot more interesting of a storyline than some of like the mid level teams at the very least that we're going to see participating in the year next year. So like, I like look when Immortals was just losing every year, like that was pretty uninteresting to me. You know, if Toast starts to, <laughs> to you'll see Toast perhaps start panicking if his team starts underperforming in the summer. That's going to be a little different than than what we've seen from the Immortals uh, folks in the past. So. I don't know. That's kind of my my thoughts on why I'm like very interested in seeing what these two orgs do in the LTA next year. Yeah, I mean, love is fleeting. I, this is just more realistic, right? It, it's not forever. Uh, you're rooting on the teams that are trying to stick around. I mean, if you if you talk to either of these guys too, I mean, I'm sure they'd say like they don't, especially in Joseph's like shoes. Like the business part is what it is, but it doesn't change how you're going to compete going into the next year. Uh, if you're hundred thieves, maybe it changes the business decision, but it doesn't change how hard or like how much drive these guys are going to have behind the scenes to uh, be the best possible. So uh, I don't know. I, I feel like both DSG and hundred thieves have done good. They've been good at being able to engage and interact with fans in new ways that a lot of people were not seeing from the esports orgs that we got used to in the league space. And that's not going to change next year. If anything, it it gets elevated with the stakes for sure. And in DSG's sense, it gets elevated by. Uh, the format that they're playing in just being a part of the LTA, not just NACL, right? So, um, yeah, I I do really think that if you are a fan, I don't know, part of a fan is like loving what you love. Uh, you shouldn't love it just because like you don't know if it's going to be around or not. So I, I feel like if you're a fan before, it shouldn't really change you going in uh, after. And if you are a new fan, you do have a lot more ways to actually connect with the teams that may not uh, be guaranteed to stick around for... Uh, this league so i don't know i feel like some fans will stray away from, away from that but uh, some fans will love that and i i really hope that those fans watch on yeah i mean you have both toast and joseph here right now as a uh, lcs or now lta fan what would you like to, what would what would help you become fans of these two teams what would help you root for both of them next year well as an lts fan um i i do I can. I'm trying to think. I can say the things that already kind of make me fans of the teams because I actually do watch NACL and I have been watching LCS. I guess I would say it, it's maybe broadly speaking, as uh, as an LCS fan, like the appeal of the promo relegation slot is it's like a chance for um like rookies to kind of get their shot and teams with rookies to kind of get their shot. So I don't know what all the rules for roster building is. And I'm obviously not like involved in the roster building discussion, but it would be cool. Like it would be, or it would be disappointing if like DSG enters the league and it's just like, Hey, we imported 50 like players who've been playing 10 years in Korea. or We just imported a bunch of Korean challengers or something. I get the sense that that's not really going to happen for different reasons, but like that's the kind of a narrative appeal thing there, and I think for Hundred Thieves, um, like one of the things that did make me kind of root for them and like would be interesting to see built on is like the success that was gained from sticking with players last year and like nurturing players like Quid, um, bringing up players like Sniper, um, and seeing them grow, um. Yeah, and I, I mean, like, I think, like, that is the kind of thing that even if you are worried, like, oh, a team might leave, that can help maintain, in, like, can help people be fans of the team is if you get the sense that they are, like, contributing something to the league and, like, care about the league, even if they're not, even if their spot isn't guaranteed that there is, like, a, like a contribution being made um, and, like, care and concern and stuff. And then also just like the obvious behind the scenes stuff that you get that's always like fun to see like comms videos and like different what are players thinking about the season type yeah, stuff. Just general content um, stuff you're saying. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, thanks, Yami, for calling in. Anything you want to shout out here at the end? Uh, I want to shout out the the LCS. I've been watching that for 10 years of my life. Uh, it's really sad to see it go, but um yeah <laughs> i want to chat with lcs at world finals that was great um and i guess encourage all americans to remember to exercise their like right to vote tomorrow um it is election day and it's cool to, for people to do that yeah. thanks so much for the call and we'll catch you next time 
Awesome. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm super excited to see. As I said in the call, super excited for Hundred Thieves and uh, Disguise to be in the league next year and to see. You know, I do think it will be more fun for me to create content about your your two teams, regardless of how they are doing, than perhaps some of the the previous orgs uh, that we've had in the in the league in the past. Obviously, Hundred Thieves been here before, but uh, the stakes are going to be a little different. Uh, we yep. can keep talking about that, Cubby, if you want to go grab the next caller, and we'll just keep chatting about it. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I actually wanted to comment on what that caller was saying, Toast. Yeah. So I think for you joining the LCS now, I don't know how many like Reddit threads or like Twitter comments you've read, but there's probably like a huge narrative push for you on like I hate imports and like please promote rookies. And I would I would just urge on the edge of caution there because like he said that and then he also said he loved quid, right? And they're both imports. Um, so, I mean, obviously you're in a position where like you have to fight for your spot, so you should definitely do whatever makes sense for you. But I think there are good players and there are not so great players. That's just the truth of it. And some of them are going to be imports and some of them are going to be rookies. So, um, I wouldn't look so much as like, oh, is this guy a rookie or is this guy an import? It's just purely, are they going to be a great player or not? Right. That's always what mattered for us. So like for us, we're not like looking at this player and being like, oh my god, North American rookie. It's like, no, we just think this player is great. And I, I think that's the mindset, because there is definitely a huge community push to promote rookies all the time, but as many success cases we've had with, like, Danny or, like, Sniper or, you know, Masu, there have also been a lot of cases where uh, these rookies don't pan out, whether that's, like, a lack of resources or because um, the people that have scouted them misjudge, like, their ability. It, it's, I would just urge on the side of caution there. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. I know uh, I've been reading some comments uh, just about some of the moves we might make, and it's a huge, wide range of reactions. Um, but as like I've been watching League of Legends for ever since I've been playing since beta. I watched really early on, and I just remember Reddit's kind of like known as the place to go for for the most immediate visceral reaction to anything. I even went back and looked at some FlyQuest's comments from when they announced their roster for this year, the one that made it to like uh, top eight at Worlds. And a couple of the, the players they announced, the comments were also like very similar. Where it's like, this was terrible. Papa Smitty's a moron. This is like, this is going to fail spectacularly. And I look at comment threads for Cloud9 Super Team. It's like, this is the best NA team in the last decade it's just you really cannot give in to what reddit's saying sometimes and i think that's a lesson i'm gonna have to learn over time very true it, it could be a great video though toast i thought reddit build my lta team you know yeah. yeah i might do a whole like read we read reddit comments at the end of this year <laughs> like if we do well we can clown on them and if we get relegated it's like shit maybe no. maybe reddit doesn't know what they're talking about are you going to be watching and co-streaming all your team's games or most of them? Or like, how are you planning on approaching uh, it? Every game that I can. I'm going to see if I'm able to co-stream on site for our opening match. And any match after that, I'll probably try and co-stream. That's awesome. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right, we got Nick here. Nick, where are you joining from? Uh, I'm calling from the DMV area in Virginia. Oh, wow. Back to back. <laughs> Do you know the other yeah. caller? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe maybe you guys should. You can do a watch party next year. What do you want to talk about on the maybe. show? Um, yeah, so my question, I have two questions, one for Toast and one for Jungle Juice. Um, I guess just moving into the new league, um, how important is content for you guys, um, specifically for Jungle Juice? I've noticed over the years, as I've been a 100 Thieves fan since you guys came into league, um, content has kind of slowly gone down. Uh, especially since we won the LCS. Um, and I just kind of wanted to ask, like, um, you know, is there maybe, like, an impact that it had on helping create teams or helping the longevity of uh, staying around in the LCS, or I guess now LTA? Um, and specifically for this last, uh, if it would be our last iteration of a roster in the LTA, I would really love to see, like, a final series or a great send-off for this last roster. Um, and then for Toast, uh, do you have any plans for 
content now that DSG is in the LTA, especially since you guys are a new and potentially unproven team? Uh, we, hmm, I think one of the things I'm going to run into problems with is I'm very good at creating content around like myself, as well as, um, a greater storyline overall, or utilizing any of my friends who used to play in the LCS. But then we never really have done anything like have five League of Legends players do a bronze to challenger like video that's kind of like popping these days in the esports scene. So I don't know how that's going to work. Like I can do the big beats, but what about the weekly videos or the monthly videos or even the daily ones? And I think that I'm going to have to do a lot of research in because it's going to be the players, the personalities that carry that. And that's going to be up to the players, right? And some, es well, you know, esports players are notoriously bad at making brands for themselves. I can nudge them the right way, but if they don't want to do content, then they don't want to do content, which some players are just like that, right? They might be really good, but they don't want to be in front of camera. They don't want to eat. They don't want to do the spicy challenge. Um, and you can't really do anything about that. I think you just don't pay them if they don't, you know, it's a contractual obligation. No, no Patreon funds for them, you yeah. know? Yeah, it's going to be a balance of like, okay, what can we really push? all players on when it comes to content like here's what i'll tell you toast it. in the last couple of years players have lost all leverage whatsoever with teams uh <laughs> they went from having all of the leverage of the relationship to now being like can i please have a spot can i please have a spot oh dear god i'll do anything to play uh, which is really depressing but also really advantageous for you getting into the into the league at this time because it gives you the ability to get your players to do content so uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't put up with too much grief if they are uh, unwilling to participate in reasonable marketing activities. We'll keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, Joseph, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the content stuff? Because I know the first part of the question was kind of talking about the decrease in content from 100T over the years. Yeah, of course. So, again... Um... I love League of Legends, and I don't want to be this like business guy that like all of our decisions are based on like business financials. But I just wanted to provide some context. Like, I think one of the reasons why League of Legends content did so absurdly well in the beginning was because the concept of the LCS, the concept of orgs blooming, was just such a novel experience, right? Like, I think when you think about Hundred Thieves League of Legends content, like the core identity piece there is the heist. And now what made the heist interesting? There's like so many orgs doing docu-series or have stopped or have attempted it before. But the reason it was like such a huge success in the beginning was because it was telling a very novel story. It was incorporating the creation of 100 Thieves outside of just League of Legends. And I think that's what drew in a lot of fans. So, you know, you fast forward to today where teams are trying to you know, figure out esports as a business. And just the truth is that like content is just a lot more saturated, right? Like everyone has tried DocuSeries, everyone has tried voice comms, everyone has tried bespoke content, everyone has tried this. So, you know, we still want to do, I, let's just say the bare minimum of like providing voice comms, providing socials, providing vlogs so that teams can get insight into our teams, not just on stage, uh, but you know, it's something that we're always conscious of and we're really trying to figure out like, okay, what League of Legends content can really be a win-win for the organization and for the fans. And I think that's something that a lot of esports organizations are struggling with right now, not just in League of Legends specifically. And I think um, two League of Legends videos that really stood out to me this year was actually ones that Team Liquid did. So there was like five League of Legends players versus like Faker that just had it like it was a, an anomaly, right? It like outperformed like almost every competitive League of Legends video uh, around the world. Um, so I, I don't think it's necessarily about content output. It's just we really have to assess like what is going to be core to the fans, what is going to be novel, because even as fans, you don't want to see the same repeated cookie cutter format over and over again. Like that's lost its novelty. So for us, it's about strategizing like 
what is essential to the fans and what is going to be a really novel experience? What can we provide there? So those are the things that we're trying to address. Um, at minimum, we'll have the same level of content output for 2025. And we're looking to add on someone that's going to help us with a lot of our socials. So I think that's like what the conclusion we've come to. And I'm happy to answer more questions on the topic later down the line if there are any. But that's kind of been my assessment from the past couple of years. With um, you talked a lot about the org landscape changing like quickly. Do you, there's also been a swap in how the leagues cover content. Like what what kind of content have you enjoyed from the LCS like that you want to see continue or like what risks because I, I think that pros is a big win but I also see like secret boardroom from LCK I don't know if you're familiar with that like I think that's a great format like bringing in old pros and having new ones as well and they just make it really fun um like how, how is that landscape shifted and like how, what kind of impact does that have on the teams like do you guys really lean heavily on pros do you like the long form content out now, now that like not everyone does it like how does that kind of affect you too um I think we rely on hev like Riot heavily a lot more because they just have a higher level of production um, to provide to these content pieces. So like, even if we and Riot had the exact same idea, I think like Riot just has more resources to execute on the ideas properly, right? So I've personally loved so many of the changes. I think Mark's done such a great job this year. Yeah. Like not only were the changes in the format amazing, but yeah, like pros and all these other content pieces that incorporate players more really helps a lot of the organizations take some of that like production resources off their plate. Um, so yeah, I think a huge step in the right direction and yeah, loving everything that the LCS and other regions are doing around that. Well, let me let me also turn, since Kevy was asking uh, Joseph a question, like Toast, you said you were going to do some research about like what is doing okay with LCS teams and what LCS teams are doing right now. I think the more research you do, the more you'll find that, like, with a few exceptions, most of these videos are not doing well. And so, like, I worry about a world where you are <laughs> going and being like, what is everybody doing? We should do that. On the other hand, you know, I know that you work with uh, somebody who I spent a lot of time training and getting better at his craft and really hit all of his successes due to me, that, that person being Broden <laughs> Plett, who is able to create a lot of great content with you guys over at OTV. But you also work with other talented folks. You're talented yourself. Like, in the time that like you've looked in the limited time you've looked at the esports content right now or just in your as observations over the years do you think that there is like something that is missing that streamer culture has really captured over the last i don't know five or ten years mm, i think oh this is this is a, this i mean there's the big this is the the golden question of esports right how do you get people to be invested in the content because we we just have so much failures to draw examples from, but so little success. Uh, I can talk a lot about this because it's just something I'm passionate about. But when I was in the Valorant scene, I would look at production like um, by the guard um, when they were still around. And I just remember they would film like these highly produced videos that probably required a cameraman, probably a couple of editors. And the, the viewership for these videos are literally like 500. 500 views, which gets you about five cents. And each of these employees are probably getting paid, you know, three to four K a month. And I just don't know where that money's being made up from. Um, like Joseph touched on this. Also, I want to say like, Joseph, from watching this, you're so brave coming on this show because each of these questions targeted at you is just like, why the fuck is 100 Thieves doing this? Why the fuck is 100 Thieves <laughs> doing that? So. Um, and, and the, the truth is, it's like what he said about content. It's like people aren't watching the content. Like maybe there's going to be a decrease in content overall throughout the year. That's because no one's watching it. Right? It's just, and it's not really the fans' fault. It's just content nobody asked for. But maybe some orgs just feel like they have to make because one reason or the other, or they see energy. I think has been doing a pretty good job at this with their Valorant um, YouTube videos. Which is essentially going full YouTube, brain rot, clickbait, Mr. B style. Um, yeah, like we said, spicy chip challenge. Who's the fake challenger player? Who's the real iron player? Um, blindfold iron to challenge. Like it's it's a it's very YouTubey, um, but that's kind of what people want to see. And we see a lot of orcs now pivoting to those kind of videos to you know different levels of success, um, but. What was the? There was a team that 
made their plays do the longest sheesh possible. I forgot. If oh, that Team was... Liquid. We were just talking about Team Liquid. That was before. <laughs> yes, that was that was a, lot, a couple of years ago, I think, uh, or maybe it was just last year. But it, it was beginning of last year, if so. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's stuff like that where, like, I I don't know how who who came up with that idea, but it's just who asked for it, right? And that's one thing a lot of these orgs will have to figure out. It's like, well, who's actually going to watch this? Like, I'm even I struggle with this right now. Like, announcement videos are easy, but if you give me my five players and say, okay, you got to make a video every week, it's probably going to be some form of like guess the rank, which um, is popular right now, right? You have to be a little YouTube cent focus. Um, and that's probably what we're going to have to do. If we can't come up with a storyline, if the players can't market themselves in the past, players don't really have to have a storyline created for them because the fans will create it, right? They'll see them stream. They'll see like the same vicious, you know, they'll see the hotshot GG arguing with someone in game, um, the diresis, like the storyline gets created by the players themselves with their fans. But now it's like the orgs kind of have to do that for the players, which is much harder if the players just have no interest in streaming yeah yeah i think it is a, a big challenge um but you know we're all counting on you to fix it because you're this the popular <laughs> content guy so yeah, you're yeah. like it, i think i think if you get um if you get relegated next year at the very least hopefully you'll have solved the entire esports ecosystems content structure so mm -hmm. um we're all really counting on you so no pressure you know <laughs> we got it yeah Nick, uh, thanks so much for the call. Anything you want to shout out here at the end? Um, just, I guess, shout out 100 Thieves. Um, been a long-time fan. So just wish you guys best of luck for this play. Yeah. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much for the call. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Catch you next time. All right, we, we have one final short call uh, before we say goodbye to Toast and Joseph. Jo Toast, are you good for one final uh, call? It'll be easy for you. I can stand to 8.30, so I got like 20 more minutes. Cool. Uh, same. Yeah. yeah. This is the final boss for Joseph. So we'll see how he <laughs> handles him. Cubby, you want to go get him? Who's the final I, boss? I, I, oh, I think you could probably make a guess as to who it would be. I don't think it should oh, be God. that difficult to imagine okay. who would be the, the final boss of the 100th oh. call line. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is the man you have betrayed the most. Uh, all right. Caller, what's your name and where are you calling from? My name is David Shinock. I'm calling from Jersey City, New Jersey. How are you guys doing? <laughs> good, good. Uh, good, good. Cubby, Cubby and I debated whether or not we knew you would be, before the show started, Cubby and I were like, okay, how do we want to handle the inevitable David call? Because uh, we're like, is he going to be able to keep it together? Is he going to start, is he going to go nuclear? And I figured, okay, well, we'll see how it goes. So, David, what would you like to talk about on the show? I just have a direct question for Jungle Juice. <laughs> Uh -oh. And that is, what is the 100 Thieves' plan of action to convince Riot that you should be the one that is kept in that guest slot or whatever it might be going forward, given that Mark Z just spoke on the dive that there are multiple people that they're, they were looking at for this slot? So in theory, you've just received a massive cash injection since Riot bought out the spot. And you have to do something different. You have to build something out of all this to make a case better than everybody else. What's it going to be? Yeah, so let's, let's address how we're going to convince Riot. So first of all, I think, I think from Riot's perspective, this isn't just going to come down to who has the most interesting brand or whatever. Because, I mean, I feel very confident in my ability to build rosters historically, whatever, and... I'm very confident in our ability to produce results. So for me, I'm not really concerned from like a competitive aspect. Like if there's another buyer interested that think that they can do a better job, I'd, I'd really like to see them try. I think what this comes down to for Riot is like, obviously there are multiple other teams in the league, right? They know that we've received money for leaving the league. Um, and I don't know if Mark touched on this, but they're going to be looking for a new buyer. And that valuation is not just important for Riot, but it's important for all these other team owners, right? So we're going to do our best to continue what we've been doing and putting forth like one of the most exciting League of Legends program. But 
I think a lot of it is going to come down to the business discussions that we have with Riot on like what the current climate looks like, right? Because um, how many organizations want to join the LCS at certain valuation points? Those are going to be topics, right? And also the organizations have to make sense for the LCS product. Like I'm sure there's a short list of organizations that would like to join, but would it make sense for them to even be part of the LCS? Like if it's a Chinese organization, does it make sense? For them to be a part of the LTA, right? So there's a lot of organizations like that which might have the capital but might not make sense. So I can't really speak too much on this topic because it, it is super sensitive and like we have to work with Riot on making sure that it's clear. But from our standpoint, the things that we can control, um, and obviously the players and staff being like the only ones really being hurt by this is like we just have to do our best to put the best program possible, get the best results put out the best content and have to convince Riot that we are by far the best partner um, for for us to exist in the LTA ecosystem, right? We're going to do a better job building your LTA product that like this is the best business decision that you can make. That's, that's kind of our goal. Um, so working on that, we're going to be announcing our roster in like two weeks. Uh, we're looking to add people on socials, making sure that the operations run smoother, but it in terms of like what can we realistically do outside of like this entire business conversation that goes on the backside, that are the things that are that are actually under our control, right? So those are the things that we're gonna be focused on. Tell us yeah, what thanks. are you gonna do to make sure that that hundred thieves does not get removed from the, the league? <laughs> Uh, ooh, I'm not sure if there's anything I can do on my end, but Will you I be sabotaging them in an attempt to take their spot? No, I think Overall, LTA would be worse off if a hundred thieves ended up leaving. I mean, there are some other orgs where I feel like, man, maybe DSG deserves a spot over them. But I feel like a hundred thieves have definitely earned the right to be here. Um, they have a huge fan base, and the way I see it from a complete outsider's perspective, it's not necessarily a hundred thieves having to convince Riot. It's almost like. 100 Thieves fans need to convince 100 Thieves to stay. Um, well, that's not going to resonate well with David, who is the number one 100 oh. Thieves fan. <laughs> yeah, because like, you can support, the, like, you should be supporting the players, right? Supporting the staff. I think there is a level of business decision coming up from like the big 100 Thieves upper management of like, well, do we really want to be in League of Legends with this? Like, Call of Duty, Fortnite, like why why are we in this, right? And I think with this being their provisional year, it's really the time for Hundred Thieves, like League um fans to really show that, hey, you know, this is a team worth keeping. This is a game worth like staying in because it's such a big part of your history. Like, please don't go. Um and they do end up leaving. I mean, it sucks, but that's just business. And it would definitely not be a lack of trying from the league staff and the league players who are just essentially pawns in this greater business decision. Yeah. Yeah. David, David is you that, are you, are you going to... You've been yeah. suspiciously uh, quiet. Normally, you're climbing over... You know, falling over yourself to try to get more words. I, in. Well, I mean, I kind of caused a controversy this week already, so I want to be as respectful as I possibly can be on this. But I'm not going to lie, the res that response, while it's great info, it terrifies me. Because the logic behind it is, okay, you've sold your spot. Joseph just said that you now have to buy back in for that spot. So in order for 100 Thieves to stay in the LTA next year, assuming the price is going to be about the same, maybe a little bit less, like, how does that, how does that happen for 100 Thieves? Because the 100 Thieves League of Legends program at the beginning of 2024 was tasked with becoming profitable. So they cut down the roster, obviously went a little bit more money ball. It worked. It was fantastic. But you still need the cash injection despite being break even. So how do we now get to the point next year where we can afford to pay for the spot when we needed the money in the first place? That doesn't make, it doesn't add up for me. And as a diehard 100 Thieves fan who, shit, I'd be willing to donate half of my content on my channel over to the 100 Thieves channel. Maybe they're trying to do I, the uh, the buy high, sell low thing. You know, they're like, okay, LTA valuations are going to go down. We'll just take the cash now. 
buy back in at a lower thing. You know, you're an, I mean, you're, if that's, you're a, and you take a partial payment now. Yeah, you're you're a, you're a money guy. You should know how this works. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's terrifying. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Joseph. If you if you do want to follow up on this, or if you feel like you've said all that you can, which I would understand given the yeah. sensitivity around the topic. No, I, I think a lot of our fans are outraged, and I think they deserve to be. Um, I'm going to try my best to provide as much context as possible, but I think for me, when we have this much fan reaction, it just goes to show like how core our fandom is. Because like I didn't see this level of like hatred for like Immortals. No offense to Immortals when they left, so. I, I do think we have a responsibility to rein our fans in and like kind of keep the conversation very real. So um, I think when it, when you spoke about the evaluation of the spot, like I just want to say I think esports is like difficult. It's not just League of Legends. And I, I think I said this to one of your posts, David, but without speaking about Riot or like 100 Thieves, like there are a lot of public organizations um, you know that have to release their financials year over year, and if you've seen those reports, it's like it's it's difficult. Um, so I wouldn't say this is like a hundred thieves unique situation. Like I would say we're probably in a better place than a lot of other organizations because we have other verticals of the business that you know we can kind of utilize with esports. So we're in a pretty good sp sp like sp space, but. That just shows like how hard esports is to navigate right now. I mean, I'm I'm sure like Toast can also talk about this because I, I know he's talked about like how much money he's burned, but it 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 is a very, very expensive uh, venture right now. And I wouldn't say like, oh, we need this money, like we're we're crashing out. It's like not that kind of alarm, and I don't want the fans to come away walking like that because that that isn't the case. It's more so of like Look, this is like a really hard climate, and this is going to give us many more months, many more years to kind of let our business run, let our people figure out how to navigate it, um, do more interesting things so that we can figure this industry out. And I think, again, this is not a problem just native to us. Like, I know Arnold from Genji has talked about it, every organization has talked about it. So, as much as like, U.S. fans have the right to think that, wow, this is 100 Thieves going through a lot right now. Um, I just want to say it's just, it's just like a problem across the board. Um, and unfortunately, this was like a decision we needed to make because as much as I am a League of Legends fan, like I'm also making sure that, you know, we're making decisions based on the best interest of the company. So it, it's, it's a really hard decision, but that's that's kind of the reality of it. Yeah, I mean, just to, to tag in here, you know, and I, it is difficult because I, I think I want to like dog on Hunter T at times a little bit. Like, uh, I was frustrated with Jacob whenever he made his Reddit post, which I thought was very dumb. And, yeah, that, uh, that and one. it's not the first time that I feel like Jacob has gotten distracted by another esport whenever his team was in a critical junction on the League of Legends space. But I also think of people like Joseph who are down to come on a show and just take the hits, as Toast was pointing out, from frustrated people. And to me, that doesn't seem like somebody who's checked out on the league. Because like, we never heard from Immortals folks. I feel like we barely hear from uh, from uh, Dignitas folks. Like, There are a lot of people in the space that feel very checked out and you know, waking up uh two days after world finals to a message from joseph that's like hey i want to get out and like talk to the fans about what's going on with 100 thieves uh i think that that is like a sign that the org still does care about their their fans and that there are people over there that do so i don't know i i think as depressed as i was about a lot of the news that that hit over the weekend um or at least the beginning of last week or end of last week i should say like i it is still exciting to see that people are like bought in and, and want to have these conversations and stuff um, alongside new folks like toast who are like ex still excited about entering the league and doing these types of stuff. Cause uh, it's not like toast got like bullied into joining the LTA. Like this is an exciting opportunity for him. I'm sure that's why a busy guy like him is taking time to talk about this stuff on the show. So um, yeah, I, I don't know, David, I hopefully this, Hopefully this helped you in some ways, um, but if there's anything that you want to say here at the end or shout out, that would be good. 
No, I just want to give uh, Jungle Juice all the credit in the world that he deserves. My man has been part of the org for such a long period of time. And no matter what's happened over the last few days and all the drama that's unfolded, like I have nothing but the utmost respect for what you've built at 100 Thieves. And we all as fans are indebted for a lot that you've done. So truly, thank you for everything, regardless of what happens. I'm excited for this upcoming year. I can't wait to see what you guys announce, and it'll be fun to cover. I appreciate that. Thanks, David. Thanks, David, for the call, and we'll catch you next time. Yeah. See you. All right. We only have uh, maybe we've got about nine more minutes with these guys, and so I think maybe rather than have a call, I don't know, Kevin, if you saw anybody that's in there. I, I don't have like another have, one lined up. Have for some these guys final in conversations particular. with them. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Toast. I mean, what are you most excited for with having the team in the league next year? Because I know this is something that you've been aspiring for for a while now. Um, a big part of it is just getting more attention to League of Legends because I think for a lot of my friends, almost all of them come from League of Legends like 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And it's cool to kind of be part of their world in a way. Um, because I didn't come from League, I come, came from a very different game. Um, but I, I grew up watching League of Legends, I grew up playing League of Legends, and I still think, you know, at the end of the day, everyone has touched League of Legends at some point. So being able to kind of participate at a high level is really exciting. I remember I went to Worlds two years ago when DRX won, and after we were walking, you know, back to a hotel, uh, I said to my friends in OTV, like, wouldn't it be cool? to own a League of Legends team and to like win worlds, which, you know, is a probably not going to happen for the You're at step one. Uh, step, step two has a lot of things in between. But uh, I, I always just thought it would be exciting. Um, yeah, except for our roster, I think the idea of growing um, young, you know, players as you know, both players and human beings is a challenge that a lot of people face, you know, whether they're parents or coaches or managers. And it's been it's been it's been a fun a challenge and hopefully our roster gives the people what they want, um, which is, you know, as I'm learning very different things people want out of our roster. So we'll see what that looks like. Yeah, it is a challenge. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, do you have any advice for Toast? I know you've been giving him some already throughout the show. But I know. As, as it's so funny because you're on one end of the spectrum and when it comes to team situation in the league and he's on the other. It's it's a funny situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I already said my piece on like rookies, and I, I don't I don't mean to give like unsolicited advice. I just I just I really want to see you guys succeed because you guys just remind me a lot of like um the you know owner coming forward like that that is just like such an amazing storyline and i think a lot of fans want to see like orcs from tier two succeed in the in like the lta so i really am rooting for you guys even though during the season i might not be (laughs) um i think when it comes to roster approaches um uh, i don't know how far you are in the roster building process yet but uh just keep track of like all the rosters that all the other teams have already built, I'm sure you're already doing that. And then there's going to be a couple fringe players that I'm sure you're going to be competing against with some of the orgs that haven't signed those. So, like, those North American players are, like, key. You can figure out the rest, but, like, obviously you have three North American slots. You really have to just, like, figure out what are the last fringe players that you're competing against. Need to nail those down, like, ASAP. And then I think the rest is, like, pretty easy. Like, when it comes to imports, like, as long as you do a very thorough research, you will always have, like, two or three candidates that I think will be fantastic. So don't start there until you know who your, like, North American players are. Because that's, like, what is actually going to win you or lose you games in terms of, like, a roster building perspective. So, um, yeah, I I think that's the only advice I have. Just, like, have fun. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely good advice. Uh, we're still, I don't think we technically signed anyone. Um, you can't. Yeah, doing, <laughs> so if you technically yeah, signed somebody, legal, then you would can't. be breaking something. Yeah. But yeah, we are trying to, you know, keep in mind like, oh, okay, like how many NA players should we have? Is it 
five NA rookies and four NA rookies. And I think that's a question that is hard to answer. I think if you listen to like a lot of NA, like very diehard fans who want to see NA do well, like they might say, oh, just get five NA rookies and let them grow. And, you know, in a perfect world where there's no relegation, maybe we can experiment with that. We can get crazy with that. But we don't really have that luxury. And I think, you know, even watching from the sidelines, the difference between NACL and LTA is really big. Like we've seen players step up and the storylines are great with APA and Masu. Um, but you don't really think twice about like the 80% of other NACL players that went up, got their shot, and then just kind of faded away after a few months, whether or not it was justified or not. So yeah, we're, we're definitely trying to balance between the whole, okay, well, how much NA talent is enough, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think I, the, I, the major, just... go ahead. I would just no. say there are certain roles with more talent depth than others, right? That's something else to think about. Like, I think top jungle should be pretty straightforward and easy for you guys. Like, and I think there are a lot of good North American options. I think AD, you'll also have a decent number of options. And I think when you look at support and mid, that's when your pools get a little bit shorter, from my opinion, at least, right? Like, do, do your own research. But yeah, that should also inform, like, where you can and can't import. And that's that was pretty much the ethos of my message is, like, just look at yeah. the talent pool. It, uh, if, if every role was jungle, then and it would be saved. It's another off season of that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I it's yeah. I think one of the the reasons you see that sentiment toast where people are frustrated about this is that for a long time there were I mean it was not too many years ago that we had team owners that were all trying to lift the import rule because there and there was just yeah. kind of a rejection of NA <clears throat> talent, right? And so. I think there has been a uh, frustration from fans for a long time that like when, when Joseph says like, go find the good players and build a roster around them. Like, and it's all about finding the good players for a lot of team owners and GMs for a while. It felt as though from a fan perspective, well, they just think the only good players are outside of this region. Um, and so that I think has been the pushback, but I, I think, and I do, and I also do find it ironic that so many fans have, wanted promotion relegation back we now have some version of that and they're like but these promotion teams better just play with like <laughs> high risk ro high reward rosters um and you know go in all in on rookies and stuff and it's like no that's that is the downside of the system and people have just forgotten so um i do know that you both are needing to leave so uh, we'll just do a quick round of shout outs uh, joseph anything you want to say uh, before we say goodbye yeah, I mean, just thank you to all the fans that have been tuning into 100 Thieves Hotline League or just like League of Legends in general. It's been like a huge rocky couple of weeks. Um, I think from an org perspective, like the, like none of our orgs would be able to operate without its fans, its community. So I think this is like the bare minimum that we should be doing when it comes to a large change like this. So I appreciate you guys like hopping on, listening to what I have to say no matter how much of it is like regurgitated PR or like stuff that you guys have heard already, but I really do appreciate it. And we will do our best to try and p prove people wrong and, you know, continue a fantastic roster, hopefully that we were able to demonstrate last year. Yeah. And I should say for folks, we're going to keep uh, live on this after we say goodbye to our friends. We're going to talk about worlds and other stuff too. And yes. maybe some more general conversations about it. So please don't leave uh, toast. What do you want to say to all the potential disguised DSG fans out there, you know? Uh, please support DSG. We are small, but we got a big heart. And um, hope you guys like our roster when it comes out. And if you don't, make sure to let us know on Twitter and Reddit. <laughs> how, how can how can Especially they support Reddit. you? Uh, pardon? How can they support you? How can these fans support you? Uh, well, I mean, we have a Patreon for five bucks a month, and you get to actually see our entire financial sheet. We just throw it out there because the way we see it is like, you pay five bucks a month, you're a shareholder, so you get access to how much we're spending. So if you're curious about each of our players' salary, 
uh, you can go on there and, you know, if you want to say someone is paycheck stealing, well, you can see how much they're stealing exactly because, well, um, holy shoot, that is it, crazy. Yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, if we're paying them yeah, minimum and they the content game, <laughs> oh know, my god, you can actually call people up for how much they're stealing. Yeah, I mean, if they're getting paid minimum, you know, maybe don't flame that as much because like, he's just making like 70k, but if we're paying someone 200k and they went 0 20 in lane. Yeah, you can use it against them. <laughs> wow. You're blowing Joseph's mind right now. This <sighs> is this is the this is a transpar transparency on at a level he could have never imagined. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess I need to subscribe to that Patreon so that I could use it for content creation uh, next year yeah. as as things go on. Uh, cool. Well, I will say thank you to both. Oh, toast! I've heard a rumor recently that you've gotten into physical card games. Is this accurate? Oh yeah, um, I've I've been trying to find new hobbies, so I, I'm looking at Pokemon and One Piece. Well, let me make a pitch to you really quickly. This weekend, at the Hundred Thieves facility, I am hosting a pre-release for a very new player-friendly Magic: The Gathering set that is coming out this weekend, and it's oh. filled with esports and gaming people that you may know and appreciate or like meeting and uh and it's at joseph's hometown of hundred thieves offices i don't know if he'll be there probably not but let's pretend that he is uh so if you want to do that let me know uh follow up afterwards because it's like yeah it's very new player friendly everybody you don't need cards because you just get the cards there and it's it's a good time yeah, is there going to be any potential free agents I don't I don't I don't believe that you will be able to talk to those people based off of the fact especially cuz I see that one of the league ops persons are in or people are in the uh, Twitch chat right now watching so I'm sure no free agents well, for you to speak to. Is that person going to be at the event, Travis? That's really all. The they won't be. They won't be. Oh. Although Whoopley oh, will be so there. There's a, there's a there's potential for tampering. Is what you're Whoopley saying. will be there, and he is uh, okay. head of amateur. So that is uh, you need to keep an eye out if you're talking to any tier two uh, players. So either way, just let me know if you want to come on or if you want to hang out uh, at that. Uh, you'll see some familiar faces there, including Golden Glue, for instance. All right. Uh, thank you so much to Toast and Joseph for coming on the yes. show. We're going to say goodbye to them now, and we're going to do a very awkward live transition over to our other guests. But again, thanks, guys, for coming on. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks for having, thanks us. For having us. Cool. See you all later. All right. So I'm just going to call you back on Skype, Ooh. Cubby. Yep. Um, and we'll add in Spooks, who should probably message me right now on Discord if he's listening to the show, while I do this crazy live transition where everybody gets to see live how this all goes. Cubby, tell me about what you've been watching lately. Oh, uh, I know that you finished Agatha uh, along with me. Uh, we, we both wrapped that show up. Did, did I know that you were bummed halfway through the show. Did, did it come around for you in the end? Uh, I have mixed feelings, so we're not going to give any spoilers. But yeah, uh, for those that don't normally watch the show, normally Cubby and I have a quick chat at the beginning. Actually, it was a, uh, a thing that me and Mark started back in the day where we would talk about uh, what we've been watching lately and so no spoilers but yes i did finish agatha i thought it was the best show in a while on it was on uh, disney plus but it was uh i have mixed feelings about the ending i heard that okay. the last episode was originally supposed to be like a standalone like movie type thing that they were going to put on the uh on disney plus and i feel like what? i could feel that that was the case yeah i saw this conversation over on reddit that originally they were going to do like a Hello. a special halloween thing uh, we need Spooks to. You do you see him on? I I can hear Spooks on Skype. Spooks, you're gonna need to Discord. join the Discord at discord.gg/travis and join a channel. Uh, yeah, yeah, one second. And then mute Skype. Uh, so yeah, I I have mixed feelings, but I did really enjoy it, and I would recommend people like it. I mean, Catherine Hahn is just so she was good, so 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 good. Her and Aubrey Plaza, yeah, I think, make that show worth watching. So I I, I thought Aubrey Plaza was. Not great for me, but Catherine Hahn was very good. Really? That's yeah. a very hot take, I, I think. I mean, I think her character is like just kind of whatever. But I, yeah. I I've never been a giant fan of hers, I will say. I think she's been kind of played the same character well, and has been liberated in a lot of what she's been. Anyway. We'll leave that one for the waiter. I don't Sending... see Spooks in a channel. Yeah, he's, you join uh, a channel, Spooks, I'll drag in. I think he's there we go. Oh, uh, there we go. Hello. Sorry, I'm a little technically deficient. 
No, you're good. You're good. Glad to have you here. Uh, can you keep talking so I can balance your audio? Yeah, testing, yeah. testing. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, if there's any way for you to get your mic a little closer, that would be super swell. Hello, hello. Is yes, that, that is so yeah. much better. Okay. Okay. We're almost there. I, I usually okay. say, Travis, uh, like around the start of episodes, to watch The Penguin because it's very good. So I'll say it again this week because it continues to be very good. Uh, and also, I wrapped up season one of Narcos and season four of House of Cards. So, yeah, you've been catching, yeah. you've been using off season to catch up on some content. I, I, I have been watching a lot of shows. Decades I did old. play Solo Queue all of yesterday, and that was nice. not good. Yeah, I feel but like Faker, Faker inspired me, you know. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Spooks. Welcome to the show. Hello. Uh, Hello. Glad, glad to have you on, Spooks. For those yeah. who are unfamiliar, because I know you occupy perhaps a more behind the scenes role than our previous guests, do you want to talk about what you do in the League of Legends space? Yep. Um, so I am the strategic coach for 100 Thieves. I was previously on Golden Guardians as the head coach before, funnily enough, that org kind of collapsed, um, which is kind of on theme, I guess. <laughs> um, hey, listen, you're you're not, until you're a narrow, you can't complain. True, true. Yeah, I have kind of been following in a narrow's footsteps the whole, oh, hello. Yep. That was me, my mic. We can still hear okay. you. You're good. Not uh, good. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah, basically, I kind of, I'm kind of able within 100 Thieves to have a role that's pretty, I guess, open. Um, Golden Glue has kind of allowed me, like when I first joined the roster, he was he was pretty open with me about it being his, his rookie year and he wanted someone to kind of bounce kind of everything off, I guess, in a sense, from preparation going into the season, how we do draft, how we do scrims, how we do review. Um, so it's been really nice for me because I haven't, had to like change my role so much and i'm able to have as much influence as i'd like within the team um so yeah that, that's kind of my kind of my role in 100 thieves currently yeah well i thank you for coming on uh joseph was like oh hey i think i'll probably only be there for the first hour or so and i was like wait yeah. we need somebody to talk worlds with and he's like i got the guy for you and i know in the past we've tried to get you on um in in different weeks and i think it's just been a, a tough scheduling conflict so i'm glad we were able to grab you yeah, I've been on a couple of times. Actually, I'm pretty sad. I wanted to say hi to Toast because my uh, my wife's a big fan. I always I always see on her screen. I'm like, she's watching some Toast content. So it's sad that uh that he's. I'm sorry. Off. If I had been <laughs> warned ahead of time, I would have I would have made it happen. Uh, but I'll say it happens. Gonna, happens. Yeah. you'll you'll be able to see him hopefully at the studio next uh, next year. So maybe you or, can. Or, or at the hundred thieves uh, facility this upcoming week for the. Yeah, yeah maybe. We'll yeah. Event, Try know? to get him to come True. play Magic. Yeah, I'll just come in for a quick signature and then uh, <laughs> and then leave. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right. So uh, really quickly, I do need to, because of the, uh, the timing on all this stuff, I do have a quick sponsor shout out I need to do as we all get set it up for the next uh, part of the show. But as I slide into the sponsor shout out, Cubby, what takes are we looking for? I know we've got two in the can right now. Maybe we can go a little bit over and make this a mega episode because there's so much to talk about. But talking mostly world stuff right now, right? Or yeah. just general stuff? I'd say worlds related stuff. And if anyone has any leftover questions on Hunter Thieves, that too. But I, I think that that's at least like from the business end, especially it's kind of been, we, we, we covered a lot of that. So uh, anything can I, can you I, want to talk uh, about, Spooks? Yeah, I would like to quickly comment on the Hunter Thieves stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just before we move on. Um, I mean, I, I know Joe obviously talked a lot about from like the org point of view. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about like my personal experience as a staff member within 100 Thieves. Because um, I think I think from an outsider's perspective, it's easy to look in and say like, oh, this sucks for the players and it's terrible for the staff. And, you know, in, in a sense, it is, it's pretty stressful and, and it's rough. And I had that experience with Golden Guardians as well. But um, 100 Thieves as an org has been super professional. Um, they've helped me a lot personally with some of my stuff outside of the game, like helping me get a green card. Um, and going forward, I've never felt like 100 Thieves has kind of like gave me like a shorthand or like they're trying to exit and give 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 you as little as possible. Um, it's never felt like that and it hasn't going into next year as well. Um, so I just wanted to shout out the org and just kind of help people understand that from the inside point of view, it's not like they're just throwing us throwing us away and like it feels terrible it, it's not like that at all i think that that kind of clarity might might help some people i guess yeah 
All right. No, I, I do appreciate you saying that uh, because it's nice to have Joseph on, but obviously he's part of the machine. You know, he's the, he's, we talk, you're, you're not the man, you know, you're, I mean, you are the man, but you're not the man, you know? Yeah. So I appreciate uh, the, the kind words. All right. So while we've got takes coming, uh, getting ready for worlds and Hunter Teague topics, do you want to do a quick shout out to NZXT? Thank you so much to NZXT for sponsoring the show. Uh, you can check them out at the link in the description, or uh, I'm sure Numi, who is up at 4.40 a.m. We have to keep the show going fast because otherwise she's going to die. She's in London right now. Uh, you can click that link uh, to go check them out. Black Friday is coming up, folks. And I, I want you to do me a favor and start perusing what you might be interested in purchasing from the N6T site if you are interested in doing so. Because, you know... You always want to make sure during the holiday time that you get some good deals in your pocket. Uh, maybe this is the time where you're like, oh, I've been looking to upgrade my PC for a while, or I want to play a new title that's coming out, something like that. I know this is a time this week, you're probably not out there buying something, but you're planning on to do so in the next week or two, especially uh, in three weeks from now or so, whenever we're in that Black Friday zone. So go check out NZXT. You can start dealing. They, they already have a couple deals up, uh, which you might look at and really enjoy. But take a look at their player one, two, and three PCs. Take a look at the machine. If you use that link, you'll be able to see the exact uh, machine that we use to stream Hotline League. It's the one that I'm using right now, which is really cool that they've built this custom page out with that. You can see accessories, etc. And uh, when you do uh, purchase something from them, please use code Travis5 because that is going to save you 5% on your order. And guess what? That stacks with the Black Friday deals. I know this is crazy because like nobody else does that. And I thought it was crazy when they told me. I was like, are you sure that this is how it's going to work? And they, they've confirmed that it's worked with previous deals. They, yes, you can use my code to save 5% top on top of all the sales they're already doing. So really cool that they do that. When you do purchase, please purchase through my link. Use that code. Uh, that way they know that we sent you. And uh, feel free to share your NZXT purchase on my in my discord or on social media wherever i can see it so thanks so much to nzxt for sponsoring the show all right do we want to get into the first call cubby well the yeah, first of I, the second half i got it let's do it all right thank you so much uh spooks are you are you do you do you plan to travel back at all during this this holiday um, time or the off season yeah so it's been a little complicated because i I'm still in my green card process, which is ah. also why it was hard for me to get to Worlds initially. Um, but I'm planning to travel to my wife's family at least. Um, and we'll do that kind of around Christmas. It would be like a bit awkward because we have work. Like we'll have uh, practice coming up in December. But yeah. we'll work around that a little bit. Nice. Um, but other than that, I've been playing some... I know Toast mentioned before he was playing uh, Pokemon. Yes. But I've been playing... We, we started collecting Pokemon cards as well. And Ooh. and I've been playing Pokemon Go. So that's been my little off-season side quest. I've People have been trying to bait me into the, the Pokemon card gotcha game. I forget what it's called, but the mobile Oh, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had, I had Golden Glue messaging me about that before. <laughs> he was saying it's up your alley. Like, you have to get into it. So Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we've got Laser Fruit here. Laser Fruit, where are you calling from? Ontario, Canada. Ontario, Canada. What do you want to talk about on the show? Uh, so my take is that the rumored Lion Gaming roster is going to struggle to make playoffs, and I think they should have kept Summit and Keen. Do you want to let people know what that lineup is? Because I'm sure there's a lot of folks who have missed the the rumors. So it's Licorice Top, Audi Jungle, I think it was Saint Mid, mm -hmm. uh, Hannah ADC, and Lion Support. I mean, I know we talked about veterans, but then bringing back St. Vicious, I think, is kind of worrying to me because <laughs> I think uh, he's always been a jungler, so throwing him mid, I think, is going to be rough. No, uh, yeah, so what makes you so worried about that lineup? Um, so I don't watch much LCK, but from what I've seen, Henna's kind of mid. Like, he's not bad, but he's not... I don't think he's worth an import slot. He's what we call a journeyman of LCK yeah. at this point. Yeah. Um, I... Don't know a whole lot about Saint. He was on DK Challengers, I think. Um, he was quite good. Uh, I didn't watch as much Challengers League for LCK this past year because I had other responsibilities, but I used to watch the league a lot. He wasn't involved in the past, but when um, C9 
when it leaked they were getting Loki, a lot of people were like, why weren't they getting Saint? Because he yeah. seemed to be the most exciting prospect coming up. Um, and then I think, personal opinion, Audi and Lions, I think were their two weakest players from Worlds. And they're the two that they kept from that roster. And I love Licorice. I think he's great. I don't think he's like the player that's going to take this team into like top four, for example. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I will say that Lion at Worlds, if I were to change any of their players, it would have probably been support, right? And Licorice for Summit. I mean, uh, Spooks has worked with Licorice before, which is why this is interesting, but. Uh, yeah. I, I know that like Licorice is really good for team environment. I think really highly of him and his play. Obviously, the comeback with Dig wasn't exactly what he was hoping, but maybe this is the setup that he's looking forward to to be successful. And it is one of the first bigger names we've heard from LCS that is actually going to be going to play in the uh, South Conference, which is interesting. Yeah, I, I think I think the most questionable pickup is definitely Henna because it's yeah. like it's kind of surprising. Normally, when you get a journeyman player you get them in a facilitating role like jungle support to get Hannah like a more experienced ADC who hasn't had much success in LCK is kind of an odd way to go about it. But um, I I have a lot of confidence in Eric uh, Licorice. Um, I think the way the impacts he is able to have on a team environment is, is super underrated. Uh, I guess at this point, a lot of people probably know how positive and um, what he brings to a team, but mm -hmm. um, I think I think the one thing with Eric is he's a little bit meta dependent. Um, I think if the meta goes down the route of like real like hard carries like Camille, Fiora, Aurelia, he might struggle a bit. But if the champion pool is kind of like in in his wheelhouse, he'll be super solid, um, and he'll just be a solid leader of the team. Um, I don't know too much about Saint. Funny that you mentioned Audi because I actually played against Audi. Uh, yeah. Years ago, um, I actually have a pretty good record against him. I was joking with uh, River that like after we lost, kind of like a little lighthearted joke. I was like, Riv, I uh, I never lost to Audi, mate. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> the guys take a little bit of the uh, the uh, pain away, hopefully. But um, I don't know. I I think. I don't want to be super critical considering what happened with us in R7. Um, and But on paper, I don't think it will be the, the strongest roster for sure. I kind of yeah. agree with the sentiment, yeah. I, I feel like, I mean, I know a lot of this kind of spawned because Summit and LS were the ones that actually leak Henna, which was funny. Uh, and LS, like, there was a big thread about, hey, like, why would they replace Summit, who did perform really, like, he was really strong at Worlds, right? Um so I, I feel like that's where a lot of the sentiment's coming for fans. That and the fact that, like, oh, if we don't like the changes they're making, then why do they pick up Saint, like the player that has been the most hyped up from LCK CL, uh, and not, like, why didn't Saint go to C9? I, I've seen that from fans, too. Um, I don't know. We'll see how this all plays out in offseason. I will say that, at least with um, Audi, like, he, I, I think he's the person that was the most successful player in the LOA or the, the Latin system. I, I'd have to do a bit of my own homework on this, but... Like he he is very storied in that region as a whole, so I am really he's happy a, to see he's an LLA legend. So this right, point, he's very so, terrible. Yeah. yeah, I'm really happy to see those players like they will get a shot in this new ecosystem because obviously you know we have talked about how this revamped LCS and uh, CB Law, but LLA is the region that is going to suffer the most from this. So I I am really glad that still the cream of the crop gets to uh, give it their all in the North Conference where Lion is at, not the South Conference. As I said earlier, so they're going to be up north. Yeah, I think on the Summit point, um, Summit is like, it's hard to explain, but he he always has like a huge footprint on the game. Obviously, mm -hmm. whether like, you kind of saw it on TL, it's like you get the best and the worst of Summit. Some games he just completely takes over. Uh, but his laning phase is insane. Like he's, he's one of the top laning, top laners. Honestly, like definitely in the West, he would be for sure. Um, and he's always able to have an impact on the game. So I guess from their point of view as a team, if you want volatility and you and you feel like if you feel like you're not going to be strong enough in a, as a team to like take down some of the good teams, I think keeping Summit would have been better. Um, if you want stability and you want someone who's going to do their role well and be good within the team environment. And and who's to say you know what happened behind the scenes with Summit? Maybe he wasn't 
doing mixing well with the the players maybe he wasn't being a good team leader you don't really know for sure um but eric definitely provides provides that um so yeah i i guess it just depends on like what what is their goal like do they want to be a stable team do they want to slowly grow i think eric is the right choice in, in terms of that yeah uh thanks so much for calling in anything that you would like to shout out laser, laser fruit uh, yeah, I'd like to shout out Pagoda and Prize Picks and NZXT and also Toast Patreon, which I am sub to. Nice. Do you look at how much he's paying his players? No, I don't think I've ever looked at it. <laughs> well, apparently you can. So I just uh, give him five dollars a month, and that is a super interesting uh, little little thing. I wonder what the goal behind that transparency is. Just I guess just doing something different. Yeah, I mean, I think, I suspect that he has wanted, I mean, he's been doing it for a while from what I remember. And I think part of it was like, hey, we're going to just make all of our financials public. Like he would just tweet out uh, like spreadsheets in the past of like how things were going. And I assume part of it is to like help people understand like the cost of doing business in esports. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's it's funny because it doesn't feel that crazy when he's doing it on the small scale. But whenever you're actively competing in the, whatever the LCS, uh, you know, next year's equivalent. It, it is kind of a funny situation. So, but yeah, thanks yeah. laser fruit for the call. Have a good day. Yeah. How uncomfortable would you be if your salary was made public spooks? Um, honestly, like I was kind of, I was, I was kind of thinking about it before. It's tough. Um, I think in the past when the salaries were super inflated, I think people would have been, shocked at like like i had a, a decent understanding of what generally like staff and players were on obviously i didn't know the specific numbers um but it would have been like crazy in terms of like people absorbing that information i think now it's like pretty it, you're people are going to see the number and be like oh uh, yeah i guess that makes sense uh, there's no there's not going to be any yeah. surprising uh, uh, pretty much across the board maybe outside of like jojo or like a couple of outliers um this year yeah. where, you're, where you look at the number and you're like where, where do they even pull that from like i mean the rumor um, is that they're going to be offering players minimum next year like to disguised will be and i i mean yeah. i think that he kind of corroborated that a little bit uh there and i i don't know what the rev share is with a a non partnered team so perhaps right. they're also getting le lessened rev share i think that was a thing in the uh in the Valorant model, or maybe you get no rev share. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll see, we'll see what happens, but it wouldn't be surprising if, yeah, they're just not in the same financial situations. The other teams and ha have to do it that way. I would say that I think the, the salaries that you're going to see from disguise transparency, you could probably equate that to most teams at this point or like yeah. relatively similar ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, for a while, I remember the floor, even though the minimum in the LCS was 75, the actual floor was like 100. Like that was yeah. basically where rookies were starting at was 100 and nobody was really making less than 100. But uh, yeah, I do feel like there's a good chance that things go to 75, which I believe last I heard was the uh, was the minimum. So I think right. even, even in the past, some rookies were like, I think I remember Blabber on a podcast mentioned that like even on Academy, he was getting like 200 plus or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, for a while, like, yep. the really heavy rookies were. And I didn't, rates. I feel like that was less weird whenever teams were also getting paid $400,000 buyouts on, you know, yeah. players from Academy and stuff. So, ooh, the good old days. And by the good that old days, I mean, like, year, literally right? two to three years ago. <laughs> it's so insane. All right, uh, Kevin, you want to go grab our next caller? Yeah, I got it. Hey, uh, I'm so sorry, folks. I have not been shouting out subs because we've just been going so crazy, but I hope folks that uh, did sub are here to hear me say this. Glimmer Glenn, thanks for the 35 months. Oh, hi, Vega, 21. JB gifted five subs. JB, if you're here, thank you. I'm so sorry. Hopefully you catch us on the podcast if you if you don't. Magnarius, uh, sweet be good, gifted to Ergot, be kidding. Fishy, uh, good to see you, Fishy. My Nidus, uh, Lane and Yobid. Laying in your bed, I guess is the. It's like I'm laying in your bed. Uh, thank you to 504 Caesar for the twenty dollars super chat. 
Uh, Eddie became a member over on YouTube. Bob and George gifted a membership. And Jam John, thanks for the membership as well. Thanks, everybody, for all the support. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we are able to shout some more folks here in a little bit. But first, we have Stevenator. Stevenator, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand Rapids, Michigan. What do you want to talk about on the show? All right. So as a as an LCS fan since the very first season, uh, kind of bookending the end of this era as it you know moves on from the LCS name. I would like to officially declare Team Liquid as the winners of the LCS from start to finish. Uh, it wasn't really much of a competition in my eyes because TSM and CLG obviously flamed out of the league and are ineligible for the title, and that kind of just leaves TL versus C9. And I feel that Cloud9 frequently, uh, or more specifically to put the onus on like Jack as the owner, more frequently represented interests that ran counter to the health of the, health of the league while TL and Steve are kind of the only legacy org worth putting stock in going into the future, in my opinion. And I think they also had the most like hero's journey style uh, start to finish in the LCS and kind of it, it mattered a lot how they finished in these last few years to me. To Can kind you of declare them as the winner? Title. Like what are you winning? They, they're the winner of the LCS, but then you start to talk about like, oh, C9 did stuff with a league I didn't like, you know? So like that doesn't feel... When you were talking about winner, I felt you you were talking more about like competitive and long lasting and all that stuff. Well, I mean, just you know, you you compile all of what teams have done from the very beginning of the LCS, you know, humble beginnings to now. So, so it's, and, it's results plus opinion is kind of, I think what yeah. Chad is getting at. Okay, okay. It's you know, it's not all based on you know. Obviously, if it's well, who won the LCS, then it has to be like. Cloud9 or even TSM, even though they're not in the league anymore because they just have the most titles. But I think when you sum everything up, you know, narratives, storylines, positive impact on the league, um, just kind of everything that the orgs represent, I see Team Liquid as like, if we're looking forward into this new world of a new league, I see Team Liquid as the team that is most representative of what the LCS stood for uh, as it was. I mean, you, okay. I have had issues with the way that C9 has made certain decisions in the past, but I, I, it's hard for me to act as though Team Liquid was always doing the things that were the best for the league when a lot of people can point to a lot of their spending and see that they pushed like spending in very unsustainable ways for the league for a while. And, and like in one sense, you know, I think the fans at the time were like, oh, it's sick to have a team that's so committed that they'll drop millions of dollars on players and some cases even an individual player but on the the other hand like i feel like c9 and and tsm were often following team liquid's lead in terms of just blowing fat stacks in a way that like far outpaced the revenue of the league like not even in terms of like trying to grow the league trying to do anything other than just let's get the best players and win so like that is i think the I, I'm not saying I'm trying to decide if I even want to crown a winner in the sort of the way that you're suggesting it, but that is my pushback on your idea that like, well, Team Liquid just always was a force for good, and even if they didn't win as much, like they're they're the best team. Well, I okay, so I agree, and I certainly don't think that Team Liquid are free of their and Steve are free of their controversies and ways that they push the the league in negative directions at times which is why i stress like from the start to finish i feel like i saw team liquid and maybe it was just you know due to financial constraints or things that were outside of their control and if they could have it their way they would still be doing the same exact thing where they just spend out on the most expensive rosters and stuff like that but i felt like i saw growth in the philosophy of Team Liquid over the years, and I feel like the place that they have ended in this era of LCS is a lot more. Like I feel comfortable crowning them as my as my team that I associate with more than anyone else because of how they've actually invested in younger NA players and uh, kind of moved That's away from the things say, that C9. made them bad. C9, like for, for yeah, like, like the, for the, the history of the league, Team Liquid yeah. has only started ho- picking like good young native talent recently for a long time, they were the team that only wanted to go 
with like the, the i mean i feel like well both jack and steve were leading the charge on like lift the import rule but uh like i for a long time c9 was bringing up players like palafox like blabber like licorice like contracts like I got to say that if you're trying to to bring in the like North American rookie angle, I feel like C9 definitely takes the crown there. I I mean, the the points that TL has are they had the best dynasty in the league that they won for two years straight, right? Like, I I think that's a significant point. Uh, If you want to throw in like opinions and the business, I guess, like they built a successful media arm that has helped out like I, their media company is helping like riot do stuff like they freelance with other games it's actually very successful in-house i i give tl credit for that but that i mean they kind of started with lcs but ended up somewhere else which credit them like it was good business um i i agree with you that like their most recent direction is more so aligned with at least the fan sentiment that we see here but I, I like if I'm gonna give a definitive winner to the LCS, I think that C9 walks out of it with the most fans. Like the fans that were fans of C9 for every year, just because I feel like C9 was the most popular team pretty much since they joined the league, outside of the two teams that walked away, as you said. And while TL and other orgs are kind of like I mean, even Hundred Thieves like fighting to kind of get in that place, I, I have to still say that like C9 from start to end. They had the most titles and probably still walk out with the most fans. So I, I feel like they're the winners of this. They also probably, I don't want to speak for C9 here. Like I'm not knowledgeable enough about other esports, but I think League is uh, still C9's like most important esport game. And C9 would not be what it is without League anywhere close to that. Where I feel like Curse and TL, they had more things going for them in other games, like for the entire time. Yeah, so I'm not I, I feel like hold that against it. TL though. I, I like, mean, I won't. But like if we're thinking about biggest winner, like it did mean the most for C9, like as an organ business. I feel yeah. like that. I mean, like by by my definition, what the biggest winner of LCS would be, like that's a big part of it. I would honestly just call it a tie, which I get is like a cop out, but like both these teams, like C9, I definitely think had the edge on TL for a very very long time. I think TL has taken that edge here in the late game, and I don't want like recency bias to to sway me in favor of TL, but I I do feel like both orgs have been. I mean, I, I I like this call, and I feel like we're almost getting it's distracted in the argument between the two of them because I do like the idea of saying, like, hey, the league lasted for 11 years. Uh, I guess 12 if you use its 10-year anniversary counting scheme. Uh, and the it is, it is worth, like, celebrating the two teams that really stood the test of time in the league not just by like being here, but also by really being relevant at every single point in the league and often driving both the good and the bad aspects of the league um, in either direction. So yeah. I do like the idea of celebrating both of those because I feel like, um, yeah, they just stand out. I don't know if you have much of an opinion on this, Books. I know I know it's maybe yeah. weird to sit at 100 Thieves and talk about uh, which of these orgs is most <laughs> relevant for the league or whatever, but. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, I'd probably be reiterating what's been said, but I guess I would add from like a, I think the main talking points have been like competitive success and sustainability, right? Um, and I do think the the main points about TL being the like quote unquote winner would definitely be kind of a bit of recency bias. I do think since Steve transitioned like the reins to spawn kind of like between 2022 and 2023, and then they grew like a core of a roster and then built around those players. That's like, that is like the win that they've had in the last few years. Yeah. Um, in terms of like competition, I think if you exclude this year, which for obviously for C9 was a complete disaster, you would kind of look back on it and you'd be like, oh yeah, I mean, C9, like, I think overall have probably almost always had top one two or three i think they made worlds every year except for two and this was like the second time that's ever happened i'm pretty sure they've only missed worlds once before this year yeah so outside of this year like c9 has been like a really competitive team and as as you mentioned before travis like it did feel like i will say actually on on the point that you made before about raising the rookies i think something that was a challenge for other teams like on golden guardians we had a real challenge of getting good rookies like we tried to get Buzio, we tried to get Yon, 
Um, but a lot of these players didn't want to join other orgs because of like the sentiment of the org, which funnily enough yeah. they're completely correct about because like <laughs> the Golden Guardians collapsed. But um, I will say the the top tier, like the whales of the league, TL and C9 had a much easier job of kind of getting those. Yeah, the rich get richer them. type deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of agree with the overall sentiment. I think they're pre they're both uh, orgs are in a pretty similar boat if you exclude kind of the the recency. Yeah, I I think we can agree that I say the TSM lost. You know, <laughs> true <laughs> from from the start to now. I mean, that, that I mean for about, a while there was literally models. TSM lost. So I agree with that sentiment. Oh yeah, that too. TSM Immortals. Who else? Golden Guardians. There's been some sad ones. CLG. Yeah. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's it's interesting that it's such a weird episode because I think, you know, announcing all the LTA stuff less than 24 hours, I think it was, before World's Finals took place. And in that, we have like the 100 Thieves and the Disguised News. It is... It's just really tough because I, I want, like, from a content perspective, from a programming perspective for the show, I really feel like we need to do an episode at some point in time that's, like, mourning the end of the LCS because that's certainly how I feel. And I think talking about and reflecting on what the LCS was, I think, is something we'll probably do maybe three weeks from now or something. Maybe it'll be, like, the, the Thanksgiving week episode where we're giving thanks for the LCS and we're talking a lot about LCS memories we can grab some talent on or something but like yeah i yeah i mean it's been it's been a tough it's been a tough week it's been a weird week for me it's been both tough and awesome um in terms of seeing finals and going to london and all that we've barely talked about that but uh it's it has been tough and uh yeah i i do for me i do really appreciate both C9 and team liquid for standing the test of time and for always being such such good, relevant uh, organizations within the league, you know. So I appreciate everybody who's had a role in that. Faker won Worlds in the first and last year of LCS. That, that's all. That also happened. That is a really yeah. I, I don't know. Jesus. Yeah. If you did you just think of that or did you see that somewhere? Because I think I, I have not seen that yet. But yeah. Yeah, just thinking of it now, like that did happen, which is yeah. kind of wild. Yeah. I will yeah. say as well, like in at the playoffs when they had the intro showing like all the legacy players, I've uh, I feel like I've really felt that kind of emotion from like watching esports before. But as like someone who's been within the scene and like also watched the scene, seeing that happen or unfold was like pretty. I don't know, kind of took you down memory lane, and it was definitely like a like a moment of reflection, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Uh, hey, thanks so much for the call. I don't know. I know we kind of went off off base here, Steven Ader, but anything you want to follow up on before I give you your shout out? No, that's fine. I, I think uh, the more and more that you guys discuss, the more I realize that I think my take ends up being more about the optimism that I feel for Team Liquid and their philosophy going forward as opposed to the where my opinion on, on C9 going forward currently stands. And I think that as like a long-time LCS fan who's been invested in all the different teams and the development of the league and the ups and downs and stuff like that, I I feel strongly about, you know, parading Team Liquid as, like, my my favorite LCS representative coming out of this old era, and I'm excited to see, hopefully, you know, the, those things be held on to as we move into a league that's a little bit more, uh, you know, it, it's not the same as the LCS, and it certainly won't be in the teams that we are bringing out, these kind of legacy teams, I hope will represent the spirit of the LCS properly. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. Anything you want to shout out? Uh, just shout out to you guys. I recently stopped playing League like three months ago, so I don't even touch the game anymore. But without Hotline League, I probably wouldn't be as motivated to keep following the game. Uh, so I think you guys do a great job of keeping people like me engaged with the scene, even when my desire to actually play the game isn't really there anymore. Well, hopefully you you get that that desire back. Maybe Arcane will bring it back for you. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, at the okay. very least, happy to provide coverage for you. So thanks so much for the call. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, we're gonna take 
A quick break really quickly for our final sponsor shout out. We're going to talk about Price Picks. Price Picks sponsored us throughout Worlds. Really appreciated their sponsorship. We did a whole show where we were doing predictions I, and I also creating lineups. And don't worry, Cubby, you <sighs> missed your lineup and so did everyone. Uh, so mm-hmm. we're not going to do a final show for that one, but we did have Cubby, Elias, and Croissant all put in their lineups for the finals and everyone whiffed and also the viewers put theirs in and it whiffed so i do want to say uh you know for folks who were curious about what happened i think people did not anticipate the games going the way that they did at least on our show and hopefully other people had better luck with their lineups if they did play prize picks curious if if you did and you had some big win please go share it in the discord because it'd be kind of fun to see who did end up winning um out over my my goofy co-host for that show. Uh, Cubby, I don't know if you have, I think I asked you this question. I don't remember what your answer was. was uh, yeah. Do you, do you have I, a lineup, a prize picks lineup? Uh, so, <laughs> so I will oh, say really right quickly, now. Before you give it to me, just so if anybody wants to know, if you want to go play prize picks, you can do, show, do so using the link, uh, which we have in the chat on both uh, YouTube and Twitch. Uh, I'll put it over on YouTube. Oh my God, Numi is still awake. It's also in the description. Uh, you can use code Travis when you sign up. You get a really cool uh, opportunity whenever you do that where the first play that you make, win or lose, uh, you get $50 in promo credit uh, to spend later on. So kind of a fun thing. But Cubby, we don't have League of Legends lineups anymore. It's time finally for you to talk about T-Sports. I'm requesting a T-Sports conversation from you. What do you got for us in T-Sports on prize picks, Cubby? All right, I got one lineup that I find fun. Uh, right. It is Justin Tucker to have more than one and a half field goals. The what Baltimore T-sport? Ravens are is playing. this NFL? You said this is NFL. Goal. Okay. Yeah, so the Baltimore Ravens are playing the Bengals, and that's a very high-scoring game, at least I expect it to be. Uh, so I got Tucker making at least one and a half field goals. And then Garrett Wilson over 65 and a half receiving yards against the Cardinals. Um, that was low for me because the Cardinals shut down the Bears who are terribly coached and they should fire their coach and offensive coordinator. Um, and perspective there. That's the one thing I can be a fan of. Anyway, um, yeah, so his square is lower than what it usually is. And Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers had a big game. So I have him getting more than 65 and a half receiving yards against the Cardinals. So anyway. All right. Any sports fans out there, there's your prize picks lineup. But thank you so much, prize picks, for sponsoring yeah, it's uh, fun. world's coverage. I got to go back to finals because of them. I literally would not have gone if I didn't have their sponsorship because it was expensive to go over there. And they just honestly just wanted to, to help support it. So uh, if you haven't signed up for your prize picks, maybe you're like, I don't want to do this with worlds, but you care more about some sort of T-sport that's happening right now. Well, they got esports and they got T-sports. So go sign up for prize picks. Use my link. Uh, and it, it would be very swell if you did that um, because it does support the show so i see people talking about t-sports right now in the chat we're gonna move on but thank you so much price picks for sponsoring (laughs) all right we got two more callers to go and then we'll be wrapping it up i know it's a mega episode so i really appreciate everybody sticking around spooks thanks for staying up late no worries yeah all right uh cubby went off to grab them thank you to dark tarconis for the 18 months and doublelicious for gifting a sub as well thanks everybody for all the support jam john uh, I think I shouted you out, but just in case, thank you. Uh, if you haven't become a YouTube member yet, you can do so, and you get early access to content and also some exclusive videos. Uh, in fact, right now you can be submitting takes on what you would like me to do a members-only video on sometime this month. There's been some fun ones that have already been submitted. So, uh, and I'll probably I might I might do maybe I'll do two videos or something this month because it's gonna be kind of quieter. Olympias is here. Olympias, where are you calling from? Hi, I'm calling from London, United. Ah, were you at finals? I was at finals. I do have a world's final stake. Uh, nice. How did you enjoy world finals in person? Oh, it was uh, like honestly so, so amazing. Um, I've never been to a K-pop concert, but I imagined that's what it would be like because of all the lighting wristbands. I thought that was a super cool way to integrate the, uh, the audio. Yeah, finals was amazing. Yeah. Well, hey, what would you like to talk about on the show? Yeah, so my take is that I think this world in general has kind of demonstrated to me that the gap between the regions are, are closing. So kind of between LPL and LTA, as well as the gap or competition between the LEC, LTA, and the minor regions. 
And I think that this makes for a better overall, more competitive product that gets casual fans like me much more interested in other regions, competitive league as a whole. I right. guess for some some context, yeah. I'm, I would categorize myself as a casual fan. I only really got into competitive league last year. I don't even play League of Legends. So I don't know if this is a tired take, but yeah, I, I first got into them because I got to see C9 versus BLG at MSI last year, also here in London. Um, they got completely blown out, but hey, that at least introduced me to the LCS. Well, okay, so um, the overall take, though, is that the gap is closing. Yeah, that's my all take. Right. Did Now that yeah. we've seen all of Worlds, is the gap mm -hmm. closing? I do find it very funny that like the LPL... It, you know, there's been so much conversation, especially leading up to finals, about how much the LPL needed to win because, like, viewership is draining out there, and people are of the opinion that they just can't beat Faker ever and all stuff. And they were like really close to doing it. And, like, it, I feel like okay, obviously, if if L, let's continue to use the word LCS for now, if the LCS won Worlds, it would be crazy, and a lot more attention would be drawn to LCS. But I think also if the LCS got to finals and made it to the fifth game and lost, I think you know people would still be really happy. But I feel like maybe just because LPL has done that so frequently that they get to finals, they lose to Faker in the fifth game, and they're like, well, why even bother watching anymore? I don't, it is just very funny. So, uh, But yeah, I I don't know. I, uh, Spooks, what do you think? Uh, I know 100T kind of got blown out this year, but yeah. <laughs> overall, would you say that the gap is closing? Yeah, um, I was going to say I'm definitely the wrong guy to ask this question, considering I run it at Worlds. But um, I think there are... Maybe the gap was things. closing in the opposite direction for, yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, they're catching up take. beneath you, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, I have a couple of thoughts about this, actually. Um, I do think the West and the East is more competitive. <clears throat> and I think a big part of why is kind of the direction that Riot's pushed the game. Um... So looking at Worlds, a big, big big thing was obviously lane swaps. And the second big thing is neutral objective focus. Um, you can kind of like script the early game more than you used to be able to. Like back in the day, if you put yeah. like a tier three NA team versus T1 LCK team, they would go into lane phase and then get completely run over in 1v1, 2v2. But now you can kind of script the early game if you understand lane swaps well enough. So that definitely helps the Western teams. Um, the other point I made about neutral objective focus is like putting grubs into the game. It was already heavily neutral focus last year with, with Herald and Dragon, obviously, but now having grubs, there's essentially like a script of where to be at all times within the game. So you rarely get lost as much as you used to. So understanding how to close a game now from a winning position is a bit easier in my opinion. So now when you get like those, those, situ those outlier situations where the early game goes wrong for the Eastern team. Um, I think the Western teams can see more clearly how to close the game, which I think helps a lot. Um, I think the other thing to consider would be like, there's there's not necessarily a cap to how good you can be at the game, but if there was one, then the Eastern teams are like pushing that cap and you can only improve so much. Whereas the, the lower tier regions can watch their VODs get as much feedback and understanding of like, well, this is how they play the game. Why do they do that? Like, let's ask ourselves the question of like, why do they do this at every point within the game? And you can kind of learn from them. And it, it kind of enables you to close the gap a little bit, whereas they're reinventing the wheel and they're pushing boundaries the way they want to. I know there's a, there's a big negative narrative about like, oh, they, you know, NA shouldn't copy Eastern regions. And that's not kind of the point that I'm trying to make. It's more so you can get a framework or understanding of how what they're doing well and then make your own have your own interpretation of it and i think flyquest for example has a, does a really good job of that i think they understand the game fundamentally but they have their own play style if you look at their like early mid game the way they play 2 on 2 um, which is completely unique to other teams and, and especially the east is super impressive to me like i feel like when i'm watching fly i feel like i can see that their early game is not that strong but i always feel like they're going to find a moment in the game where they're going to claw it back, and it's generally because of their mid-game macro. And there's always that feeling when you're watching them. You have the same feeling when you're watching G2, where it's like they can win at any point. Um, so having teams like FlyQuest and and kind of them being able to do that is is something that's helping the West for sure, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I mean, I I was saying early on in the tournament that I mean, I think something that FlyQuest was really smart about is that they were drafting top laners that could start in lane from level one. And so you would not have to soak XP from another lane. You could actually play your lane swap starting on three lanes and not two. And by the end of the tournament, the I feel like T1 and other teams were picking up on this too. Uh, like it's I think it's part of the reason why Zeus was going with champions like Gragas and Orn and not picking something like his Nar. That I mean, he is the best Nar in the world for me, or one of them. Uh, where that champion is really bad level one, um, and can't really start in the lane. So I. I think that like through lane swaps and through a read of the game, we actually had teams that had better reads than teams elsewhere. And I said going into the tournament, I, I still feel this way now, is I really feel like we sent the two best NA teams that we've sent since season four or season six. Like it, it's been years since we sent two teams three, that were this competitive. Uh, oh yeah. Oh okay. <laughs> oh sorry, sorry about that one. Uh but we didn't make the cut. <laughs> yeah, un un unfortunately no. But uh, I, th I think no, he's I mean, sure, I, Spooks, uh, to be clear. I, I just want to step in here. I'm pretty sure he's he's sure that it wasn't the three best. Yeah. Uh, so I, I am hopeful, like, in the long run. I think a lot of it was, uh, like, what Spooks is talking about with swaps just being a thing. Like, the environment you get to train in when you're laning, like, in Korea, there's a reason that everyone goes there to boot camp. Solo queue is much better. You're going to be pushed a lot more in lane in those phases of the game, whereas with swaps, you can kind of get around and script that. Uh, and I mean, find other ways that you're pretty much only facing those scenarios in scrims. So everyone's, it actually kind of takes one of the advantages away from some of the Eastern teams for me, just what they get from solo queue, uh, and ping differential as well. So I don't know. I felt like this world was so interesting, like for a lot of aspects, I find it ironic that such a young fan is bringing up that the gap is closing. Cause we've been talking about this for 10 years, but I can't say sincerely that I, I feel like NA like did send two good teams. And, uh, I would love to see those teams stick together going into next year and really, like push each other and elevate the region uh, moving forward as well. So uh, I don't think I mean, either I team actually, has any reason to split. I actually also think that even the gap between the minor regions west was in. I don't want to talk yeah. too much again on 100 Thieves, but like um, last year when I was following Worlds, I didn't really pay attention to minor regions. But then this year, seeing what Gam was able to pull and despite everything that went through in their region, Seeing Payne and Leon and PSG, hell, give G a run for their money during MSI performance here as well is really cool. And in some ways, it actually gets me more excited for this LTA format because, um, again, I don't know too much of the context, but if the top of LTA South kind of, you know, on a good day, maybe give um, LTA North regions or uh, teams a run for their money. I might make region versus region matchups more exciting to see in general. And plus the global format, adding a new tournament, being more region versus region match also good fun as well. Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit Olympias there, but uh, I, I do, you know, I do appreciate how this is leading you to optimism for the next year because we'll have to see, especially with the more international events. Uh, anything that you want to shout out here at the end? Yeah. Um, one final thing to sneak in for the other traditional sports fans out there. I think this World's Finals, like the 2016 NBA Finals, where LeBron James led the Cavs back from the brink, won to beat Golden State. So I think, you know, that was pretty good cool to see. Who, who was Kyrie? Because Kyrie shot 70% from the field in uh, those games. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. We can have that conversation later. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. Shout out, I guess, to the World's Production Team. Finals that was amazing. Watch shout out to NZXT and all the sponsors that make the show great. Thank you so much for the call. And we'll catch you next time. Hey, speaking of T Sports, didn't something big happen in LA? Cubby? Uh yeah, or the Dodgers that, won the World Series. Yeah. Was that before our last episode or after? I can't remember if it was when I was in London or in Vegas. It, it was only a couple of days ago, I believe. Because I was driving, I was actually driving around Dodgers Stadium, and I had no idea what was going on, and I just saw, like, just floods of people going around, and there was, there was like, lots of graffiti and stuff on the wall with the, loving the Dodgers, so I think, I think it was definitely recent. Yeah. So, Cubby, America won the World Series, right? They always do. Exactly. That's Pretty what I'm talking about. It's because we're so America good. Also, always wins the NBA too. 
Yeah. Yo, why can't we replicate the success that we have in the NBA and the MLB at Worlds? Maybe we need our gamers to be seven three. Maybe that'll help. You know. I mean, we yeah, have. I, mean, I think, I think it's hilarious. Giant like, players. On the NBA, when they crown the the champion, and they they always crown the champion as the world champion, it's like, yeah. <laughs> isn't it such like that would be like the Olympic champion, right? Which, to be fair, America is always the champion anyway. It's closer like, though now. It is. But, who's yeah. who's the who's contesting them? It's like one of the European. I mean, right now it's Jokic's team. Uh, I I'm blanking uh, on which. Uh, Serbia, right? Yeah, so Serbia, but like also um, the Australia is decent. France is decent. Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, international basketball is like really scaled. Oh, nice. All right. Yeah. Anyway, let's get out of this fucking T-Sports conversation. I just wanted to throw you a bone, Cubby, and you did nothing with it. All right. You want to get the last caller? Uh, it was a really uninteresting World Series. I just pretty, two all-time games. Are you like not a, 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 I believe they're referred to as Doyers. Is that? I, I, I'm a Cubs fan, sadly. It may or may not be where my name originates from, Travis. Oh. You know, or the Who? Cubs suck. It's too bad. No. We're going to go get this next caller or not. <laughs> All right. Thank you to nobody. Nobody has subbed or remembered. I have no one to shout out to for this last one. So now we so. truly are at the bottom of the barrel here at the end of the show. We got one final caller for this mega episode. We're going to really be, there's going to be a lot to talk about in the next couple episodes, folks. We are going to try to get Mark on. He has hinted he might be available next week. So that should uh, be a pot potential cool episode. Aztecs is here. Aztecs, where are you calling from? Uh, calling from Missouri. From where? Missouri. Missouri. Okay. I thought you said wizard at first. Uh, I turned you up. But <laughs> yeah, I meant the wizards he's... of the coast headquarters. Yeah, yeah exactly. Locked in the wizard 101. What do you What do you want to talk about on the show? Uh, so my question was for Spooks. Um, so with it being the postseason, preseason, offseason, whatever you want to call it, um, people, like dirty little leakers like Travis, for instance, uh, will leak some of the rosters or some of the big players that teams are getting ready uh, to, to release videos on. There's this huge hype, and then, boom, LEC Wulu will just waste all the hype. Uh, how do people in your position or orgs in your position, um, how, how do they manage or how do you guys feel about leaks? Or is there... Uh, a way that you avoid certain players from getting leaked or do you kind of just shrug your shoulders on Twitter and you're like, Oh, that sucks. Um, or do you laugh and you're like, man, they get either got that really good or they're way off. Yeah. I mean, to be, to be honest, it's probably a better question for Joseph, but um, I think from like a competitive standpoint, it doesn't really affect us because people are going to know what our roster is pretty early on anyway. Um, I think, funnily enough, some teams actually leak their rosters intentionally. I think that's not something that the public is aware of, but they do it as a way to like get more, people more excited about it, I suppose. Um, I guess from my point of view, uh, hmm, I don't really have like a, a strong opinion on this. I think maybe Travis was the best. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, it doesn't affect like the competitive point of view much at all so, so you guys don't actually care about like i'm sure yeah i agree that joseph is the more like for a gm who's trying to do it it's probably more has more uh, effects but like it's not weird to you at all whenever you see this stuff get out you just kind of shrug it off oh actually no i did have one thought i do i do know that there is an issue where some players in particular kind of lose their leverage in a sense because yes when players are negotiating between multiple teams and then all of a sudden Wulu is like, they've committed to this team, then the other teams just pull out, even if they're not necessarily 100% locked in, and then they lose their leverage to negotiate their salary. So I think that itself is a huge issue. Um, I don't, I'm not like super informed about that. So I'm not like one that would be good to talk to about that but i do understand that's definitely a problem and i do think it's a problem within the tier two scene as well um i so... mean it is but our off season won't start until later because it's like the split doesn't start until split two so yeah yeah, yeah. in terms of it being weird um sometimes it is weird in terms of like i don't even know how they find out this information i've had a couple of moments where it's like I've been announced and I have no idea. I've talked to like three people. So in my head, I'm just automatically like, was it 
was it fucking an era? Do you drop? Who did you drop? Who do you leak this to? But uh, it is kind of shocking somehow, like how this information spills out into the world. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what I could say here. Um, it's like <laughs> se- it's funny because it's like sensitive for me because it's like conversations around the types of sources I have. I have for the most part decided to sit 2024 off season out, just with all the travel I've been doing and everything. It's been I don't know. I just, I've been less drawn to the idea of like doing all the daily messages of hitting up sources. Oh, whatever you're hearing, what are you hearing? And then like having a, a, uh, what's the, the show with Charlie day, the Charlie day board of trying to draw all the connections between all the different players and stuff. But I, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people don't, I agree with what uh, Spooks was saying, which is that a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the sources are within the teams themselves or the agents. Those are usually, yeah. I, I think it's easy to say that because I think people understand that's how it works in like T-Sports as well, Yeah, is that you're usually hearing it from within the team or from uh, agent or representation of the player. Uh, sometimes players themselves talk about it, you know, where, uh, you know, you'll you'll talk to a player who's like, Oh yeah, I they, I was gonna go here, but then they fucking picked this guy up instead, which is a joke. That player sucks, and I'm like, yes, yes, they do. Meanwhile, I'm like, okay, now I could draw the next line on my chart. Uh, so it is, it is just uh, it is like an interesting way that it goes down. But yeah, I'm sure on the team side, it is it is frustrating, especially for GMs. I I do, in my opinion, the sort of threat of these reports blowing up existing conversations or whatever. I've always felt like that was very foolish um, because if it was happening, you know, people get stuff wrong and oftentimes things are reported when they're like at 80%, you know, or one party thinks that it's pretty much done, but the other party still hasn't, you know, so like there's always room for these things to go awry, which is why I often will put like confidence percentages next to, the names or you know conversations i'm having because things are very fluid and like it is not things have happened before where somebody has committed to a lineup and then they hire ls and ls blows this up i I mean i could talk about this because ls confirmed it like there was a time really close to uh off season date where i was like this is the c9 lineup and i put it out there and then c9 signed LS and LS looked at the roster and was like, I don't care that you have planned on this and that this is like the plan and you guys are committed to this. Like we're going to make changes. Um, and then he came in and made those changes and the, the lineup was different. And I got a lot of grief from other haters who were rooting for my downfall, I guess at the time about how I had reported incorrectly. Um, when in reality I had reported correctly, uh, but things changed afterwards. So, uh, it is just a uh, an interesting business for sure, but yeah, it, yep. it is it is really fun to be a part of sometimes. But other times, I'm just kind of like, yeah. I'm. I mean, I'm not a leaker, but I'm privy to inf- info, and I probably have leaked stuff on accident once or twice. Um, I I think the interesting thing is I actually find like what gets leaked now so boring because of all the preconditioning like preconditioned relationships. And agreements that are in place like what spooks is saying with you know hey oftentimes the source is just the team itself right and that's how the information gets published uh because there's that agreement just to make sure that like whatever gets leaked is correct like it makes it boring like in the past we used to have oh this player is in talks with this org or this player could go to xyz you don't even see those anymore it's just like we kind of speculate on who might be going where and then when it's like the first report you get is they verbally agreed and then the way it's published like and the people that are responsible for it now it's done and we just publish it to be first to the info. And I, I just don't find that like smart or reasonable at all. I thought it was way more entertaining when like Jacob Wolf would do his show, have the agreements in place, and then just have those people be a part of the show when you actually announce everything when you can with free agency, right? As you like he would at least hide some surprises, or there would be some surprise with the way it worked back then. And it wasn't just like, oh, there's a verbal agreement. And now like if we get any surprises, it's probably gonna be Hey, this verbal agreement is no longer in place. I just yeah. don't find it very interesting. But that's at all. how people it works in every sport, like Cubby, is like people announce it as verbal agreements occur. 
But no, like I feel like there are just way there is more coverage based on the rumors. Like there are things like, hey, sources tell me that this person is gonna like you know they're not gonna have a job, or like they're gonna get traded here. Or like in sports, you have oh like this team's looking to trade this player, but you don't know where they're going yet. Or in free oh. agency, it's hey, this I'm player a little has confused because when the what you're talking about is a scenario where like the show would happen on free agency day and everything would just get announced then. But it sounds yes. like you're saying you like it more when there's like build up and discussion ahead of time. So I no, think you would I, like I, it more I like now. When it's announced then because it created the actual build up and discussion. Uh, there's no more discussion about this. Like we just wait to see something get leaked and then that's it. Like I don't talk about well like, the discussion who's going where the discussion used to happen. Like it, it feels to me like there's a lot more discussion whenever myself and others would say, yes. "Hey, there's a rumor or discussion that this might end up happening." Right, and that not when it anymore. was a situation where everybody would just wait till off season day and then like everything would get reported. Then, like that was part of the reason I got crap for going with like fifty percent projections at times and being like, "Hey, this is I've now moved this to from twenty percent to fifty percent, and then later on to like ninety percent." But I thought that that was more, I always felt like that was more compelling for people because you got to it see is. everything in action. Um, yes. I, like, but like so, that just doesn't exist anymore because of how it's reported now. Because yeah. now it's like, it's verbal, it's published, there's no discussion before that. Whereas before, there used to be way more discussion about it. Like, I mean, we learned that so you're saying was I should have done to, more, I should have been doing more of my, uh, my stuff this year, I guess. I mean, it, it, it isn't like necessarily like your job to do that. I think that the people who do make it their job, like it's just bare minimum where it's okay. We have the verbal agreement. Our sources are within the team. We're going to be first to publish. We're going to get all the impressions on Twitter. There might be an article and that's it. Like how interesting would the Jojo off season be if it wasn't just an article that is posted afterwards because like that, like that's it. Right. I, Cause It'd I thought, I mean, I thought it was impressive like, that they did like Jojo's path story, yes. but you're saying you well, wanted like, what to, if that was to have a build up first. Yeah. But what, what if that's like before we actually figure out where Jojo is? Like, I mean, I, I'm with Spooks that at times it can be really harmful for a player and their negotiating power. But at other times it can be really fascinating. Like, what if like if you're good at this, you put out like, hey, Jojo might like might consider role swaps. And then you get this like fascinating discussion, which like, oh, my God, if that's the case, like what role is he looking at? And like with what team? Right. If you're actually good at this as a leaker to drum up the entertainment side, then, yeah, I mean, you can do this. I, I just think that it's like absolute bare minimum now it's it's not even a leak it's just a verbal agreement they're first to publish that's it there's no discussion around that and i kind of miss it because i think a lot of the hype of off season is just gone about what could happen it's like okay this is gonna happen and it's confirmed like the most uh like the, the biggest hints or leaks you get is just players like tweeting out shit because they're bored and they know they'll get clicks like people like click on it which is fine they should do that but also like why does that have to be the case like i I think the people that like, get the information now, like, it just really kills a creative and it's published in just an archaic method where it's a link to an article instead of like a video, instead of like being a short or anything. It's just archaic the way it's done now. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to fault those guys too much for like one. I think they've been really good at it. Uh, like at the at the way, thing that they have been doing, I think they've been really good at it. Yeah, they're good. I don't at fault being them the much the right info. for doing yeah. less of like the the video stuff. I mean, I do think that that is like probably a better long term path for them. But if that's not your forte, then like it's not your forte. I, I I think I was one of the few people who felt comfortable to do that stuff on camera, but also was able to get the information. And I think that there were other people who did this on camera, but were not necessarily and they they could get the information, but were not necessarily as comfortable on camera. So, um, I don't know. I, I will say that like folks in chat who are like, Travis, you got to do this. I, this is what we come to you for. Like I, I do apologize for not doing it. I think as I tweeted last week when the LTA stuff got announced, it has been like a tough time for me. I've been having a harder time getting as hyped for the LTA as I normally do for like the next season of the LCS. Which does not mean that I'm like not excited at all. Um, I just have a lot of complicated feelings with the LCS going away and with, um, you know, teams changing and just like the, the new stuff. And so it's been harder for me to be like, it's, it's a lot different than in 2021 where it's like, oh boy, like who's EG going to sign and like, what's golden golden guardians might actually put together yeah. a really compelling roster and like all these different things. Uh, it's, it's been, I don't know. Uh, it's just been complicated for me. I, I mean, think it, I, I, I was 
I'm, I'm a growing. big fan of the LCS, and so it's it's yeah. been tough to see it transform. You know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I feel like I'm hopeful for the way the teams will interact next year, but there is also the reality of like all this isn't growing, and I feel like that's. I, I, I understand that being an underlying sentiment or like an overarching feeling for you as well, Travis, because I, I feel that way too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, Spooks, that we've just been talking past you for a bit. No, you're but, good. You're good. Uh, I We do have our caller still here, Aztecs. Uh, sorry for also talking past you. <laughs> any any thoughts on anything we just said? Uh, so, I mean, the point that you brought up surrounding like deals falling through or something like if a player is in talks with multiple teams... Uh, it is definitely interesting that, like, first of all, organizations would just be like, uh, you know, throw up my hands, that sucks, go talk to the next guy. Uh, has there ever been a situation with you, Travis, where you, like, leak someone and then someone, you know, reach out to you and be like, oh, hey, like, I was not solidified with 100 Thieves yet, I was talking with Cloud9, and I was kind of leaning more no, towards that direction? that's never happened. Interesting, Okay. I mean, and that's that's why I think this stuff is overblown. Like, I remember there was one story about it supposedly happening in Europe in, like, 2017. I'm not saying it never happens. And I, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to say that, like, these things don't have impacts. But, like, I, I have always felt like uh, people really overhyped that, like, idea that if you talk about something, like, it will have dramatic impacts on a player's salary. Like, one, if that happens, I don't think that it is the person who, like, talked about it that should be blamed i feel like it's the people who are like should know better in terms of these conversations and stuff like yeah i, I, I will chip in yeah agents i i do not like or trust agents especially kelby may no uh i i know of off seasons where like agents they represented three players that played the same role and they would use those players to bid up the other contracts and like at the end of the off season one of the three players actually had a job like for me like that's just fucking criminal yeah, I, 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 this happens like behind the scenes with agents, and the, like they're the ones that you know like really try and push like get these players signed. Like they're in talks with the journalists too. Like at times it can be really tough. So th there are other bad actors in the space yeah. as well. Kobe was joking about Kobe, by the way, for the people that don't don't realize that. But uh, yes, it. I, I I don't like the chain smokers though. Uh, so Kelby can have that one. Well, I don't think he likes their new iteration anyway. Uh, thank you so much, Aztecs, for the call. Anything you want to shout out? Yeah, um, shout out the boys. Um, shout out uh, the card shop I go play at, 5C. Um, Javis, go pick up uh, Foundations. It's super sick. We've been opening product. It's super fun so far, just looking at all the new art. I'm hosting the pre-release on Sunday at 100T, and I'm getting messages from Croissant on the side right now asking me if the show is, or the show, the set is good enough for him to play on both Friday and Sunday. So I... Uh, I'm I'm hyped for the set. I think it'll be fun. Yeah, it looks really cool. Unfortunately, they're going towards the Pokemon kind of art style. Um, I've liked Magic's foiling, and that's why we got to get Spooks stuff. out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how do you, Oliver? How do you feel about the changes being made the standard and incorporating more sets moving forward? I bet Travis surprised I know that one. I uh, I think that like, are you talking about like universes beyond and that yeah. sort of thing? Or well, no, uh, I think the it's one we're adding. Yeah. It's like six sets a year plus foundations. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, well, first about Universes Beyond is that I think it unfortunately is going to make those sets not nearly as powerful or as cool. Um, I kind of feel like it's going to go towards the direction as like a um, secret layer 2.0 where you're just going to get slightly better cards that already exist uh, or just, you know, alternate prints of cards that already are out there. Uh, like Lord of the Rings will probably never happen again. Like the power level that came out with that will never happen again. Um, standard, I think, will probably like. I think incorporating new sets does make it a little bit more like mundane, and it's not going to make it as competitive. So per se, is like the big part about standard, and the reason why people like draft so much is that like it's constantly changing. Every set that comes out, there's a new deck, there's a new something. Uh, with draft, it's like every time that you you sit down, there's a new something, right? I I um, hate to I hate to cut you off, but we do have to wrap up the show. Sure, I, no, no, I, this is here. a this is a topic for a different tell different stream show that I need to do. But <laughs> no, yeah, th fine. thank you for the call, and we'll catch you next yeah. time. Yep. You should have you should have never asked a magic person what they want about a very complicated change that is. That's that's like asking somebody casually what their thoughts are on the LTA stuff for next year. You know. I, I mean, see, I, I was going to try and surprise you with my knowledge, Travis, but I didn't actually have true knowledge of the community, which is why we need you.
So. <laughs> all right. Either way, thank you so much to all of our guests, both Toast and Joseph, but also Spooks here. Spooks, uh, really appreciate you coming on. I'll give you a shout out here in a second. But first, Cubby, what do you want to shout out? Um, Shout out to, uh, honestly, the 100 Thieves guys for coming on. Uh, I know that this isn't like a super fun week for you guys. Uh, obviously, when business kind of interrupts with competing, but uh, wishing you the best of luck moving forward and know that nothing changes. Your guys as well to compete. And uh, yeah, shout out to Toast and his guys for making it into the league. Uh, they really saved, I think, fan sentiment for NACL when all the LCS teams weren't required to have teams anymore and most of them dropped. I feel like this guys gave fans a new way to root for and support the teams and the league. And I really hope that transitions into LCS. Uh, I know he put a lot of smart people around him. Uh, I, I know we talked about a couple of them, like operations side, but also... Uh, like even marketing wise, like uh, Julia was someone that I know worked at Hunter Thieves for a while, and like he had on, on DSG. And uh, yeah, I feel like he's built out a pretty smart operation, hopefully, so far. So rooting for them in LCS. Yeah. What do you oh, want and to shout out to my sister oh. who's got to work the election tomorrow night on CBS News? So she'll be up to 4 a.m. Whoa, yeah. that's hype. Crazy. Yeah. Spooks. All right. What do you want to yeah. shout out? Shout out to you guys for keeping the conversations flowing within the scene. I think it's super important to have a show like this going, and thanks for doing that. Um, shout out to my beautiful wife and dogs, and then shout out to 100 Thieves fans that are staying with us. Obviously, pretty turbulent time for myself included, obviously. Um, but, you know, like, at the end of the day, we have a really young roster, and people like Sniper, for example... When he sees those positive messages, uh, messages on Twitter, I can see his eyes light up, and he, he he loves the encouragement, and it keeps him going. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for you guys, and going forward, if you can keep that support going, it it will mean a lot to us. So yeah. Uh, thanks again for coming on. For me, shout outs. One, go vote. Just do it if you're in America. Uh, you have time if you're listening to this on on Tuesday. Uh, please please go vote. Just go vote. Uh, I think it's just important that young people vote in higher quantities that they do. I am so tired of my generation and the generation below me not voting and so many decisions getting made by my parents' parents' uh, generation or my parents' generation. And it would just be really nice if we had a more engaged group of people because there's so many people that are out of touch on simple things like social media and all this stuff. Like let's set aside all the, the controversial topics. Like I, it's just so exhausting seeing people talk about the internet in the most dumb ways or whatever, you know, um, technology, et cetera. So I would just like it if we could all become a little bit more engaged. And, uh, so yeah, please do me a favor and go vote. Uh, and like, yeah, I will definitely judge you if you don't. So, uh, so go do that. You should feel bad if you don't. You should literally feel bad. That's me being real with you. You should just feel bad. If you're like, oh, I'm too lazy to go vote, then you should feel guilty. And you should overcome that guilt by voting. Uh, you can also do mail-in votes now, right? Isn't you can like do, in certain areas, votes? you can. Like in LA, yeah. you can. It depends on the state and the location and stuff. But uh, but yeah, I just did my, my mail-in vote today, actually. So nice. um, yeah, so did so did my roommate. It was a fun little group activity when we got back. Uh, other than that, thanks everybody for coming on. Um, also shout out to the LCS. You know, it's, it is very sad, um, to see it go. Hopefully the LTA is awesome. Uh, we'll hopefully do a conversation with Mark in the next week or so about all this stuff, but yeah, thanks everyone for coming on and, uh, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>